Tradune. Blue is cheap.
kids, come away, not too close to the cars. <laughs> Aren't they lovely? Aren't they glorious, though? These will be your transports for the afternoon. Uh, no drivers. No, 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 no drivers. But they're electric. They run on this uh, track in the middle of the roadway here. Totally non-polluting, top of the line. Spared no expense. It's an interactive CD-ROM! <laughs> Lex, darling, you're all right in there. Dr. Sattler, come with me. Dr. Grant, come in the second car. Hold on to your butts. you're now hearing a paleontologist we spared no expense yeah shout out to ingen for this remote gig i really appreciate the ten dollar amazon gift card it's gonna help keep food on my table now anyway because of coronavirus i couldn't come out and meet you but i'm sure you lucky folks are going to have a lovely weekend out on the island uh, especially you lawyer guy i'm sure you're gonna have a great time Anyway, the folks at InGen have asked me to offer a paleontologist perspective on the dinosaurs you're about to see. And so, uh, let's get into it. Now, it looks like Dilophosaurus is our first dinosaur on the tour. Dilophosaurus? <laughs> Dilophosaurus is from about 193 million years ago, the early Jurassic period. Uh, that makes it one of, I guess, only two dinosaurs you'll see in Jurassic Park that are actually from the Jurassic. I guess they thought Cretaceous Park just didn't sound as catchy. But you know, it would have been more accurate, because five of the seven dinosaurs you're about to see all hail from the Cretaceous. I the really last hate that man. In the age of dinosaurs. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologize. It is so good to see you today on an auspicious anniversary. It was 200 years ago today that the very first dinosaur ever scientifically published You're feeling a bit cheated. Try was published. The dinosaurs. Whilst we may not know each other, IRL, I would consider you a friend. I appreciate that, Hugo. Likewise, and thank you for the 100 bits. Happy Megalosaurus description today. It's, uh, it's an exciting day. 200 years ago today. The very first dinosaur ever published was published. We'll be talking about that today. We'll be talking about the earliest history of dinosaur science, how much it's advanced, and of how we know what we know about dinosaurs. I had the idea to do this. If you're feeling a bit cheated, this try morning, believing the dinosaurs. Kind of last night. And thank you, Hogan, for those hundred bits there. I appreciate that, Hogan. Thank you, thank you. Um. Yeah, yesterday I got some, some questions from people that I, I think have been in this community for a long time. And, um... And some other people, too. Kind of some very basic stuff. That... Clearly I need to up my game with, uh, with talking about how we know what we know about dinosaurs. And this is the perfect day to do that. So that's what we're going to be discussing today. The earliest history of dinosaur paleontology way back in Victorian England, 200 years ago. And how that echoes forth today in our work on dinosaurs. So yeah, it's going to be a fun day. And I almost guarantee you'll learn something. I'll be learning some stuff too. But let me give an extra special welcome to anybody who might be new here because we usually have some new folks here. Um, and this fourth. Welcome to Paleontology, especially if you're new. And Golgonek, thank you for those hundred bits there. I do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Golgonek. Good stuff. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist, a scientist who studies fossils. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. 
dinosaurs are my specialty. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, what I dig up during the summers. This past summer, um, I'll check this out. Steely Dan. Oh, look at that. Look at all those wow, chickens. That's not even close to a whole year. Steely Dan, thank you for the five months. That's close enough. Appreciate your ongoing support. Thank you, thank you. Um, this past summer, I was actually able to live stream some of my field work, uh, working with some really, really cool people in Wyoming and in Utah, digging up at least three new species of dinosaur. If you're new to this community, maybe check out the YouTube page. Those live streams are, uh, are there, archived. If they're removed, America loses them forever. And Amy with a side of art, holy cow. Thank you, thank you. That pledge of ongoing support, that is phenomenal. Welcome to the community, enjoy the emotes. Thank you for supporting science, science here on Twitch. I really appreciate that, Amy with a side of art. Thank you, thank you, and welcome to Paleontology. Enjoy, uh, enjoy those emotes, huh? Hope you like them. Anyway, dinosaurs are what I study. Most paleontologists don't work on dinosaurs, and I try to remember to say that because I think a lot of folks in the general public, they kind of think paleontology equals dinosaurs. That is not the case. Dinosaurs are but a small, very small portion, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to fossil science. Brannington? Um, Hi, Danny, good afternoon. Hello, What's hello. Your take on Thalassophona? The ocean murderer played of plesiosaurs. What's my take on on the short-necked plesiosaurs? Oh, cool. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, are those the chronosaur type ones or the or are they the later one? Like, or are they like Ramaliosaurus? I forget, but they're really neat. They're certainly really neat. And the loss of them sometime in like the middle Cretaceous, I think? Or the end of the Sanimania and something like that? That, um, that seems to be what prompts the evolution of Mosasaurs. Or at least that's what allows Mosasaurs to kind of take over. They're filling a kind of a vacuum there. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, welcome, Brandington. Thank you for, uh, the 12 months of support. Excellent. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Hogan, for the 100 bits, and thank you, King Neokai, for the 100 bits. King Neokai, your first stream was... was it yesterday? Your first stream here? And you're already gifting bits and everything? I appreciate you so much. Welcome, welcome, King Neokai. I hope you feel right at home here. Um, and of course, thank you too, Hogan. I appreciate you. Um, good stuff. We are, uh, on our way to a level 2 hype train, it looks like. We've got about three and a half minutes to get there. Yeah... I love dinosaurs. Well, you're going to have a good time on today's stream, King Neokai. Well, we usually talk about dinosaurs on this channel. What was I saying before? Yeah, dinosaurs are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils in general. So the long and storied history of, of life on Earth. Dinosaurs are actually fairly recent in the grand scheme of things recent enough that dinosaurs actually shaped the evolution of mammals, like us. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit today. But, uh, yeah, most paleontologists do not work on dinosaurs. Most paleontologists work on other kinds of fossil organisms. From fossil plants to plankton, from mammals to microbes. If there were, you know, all living things that existed on our planet that left remains in the rock record, paleontologists study that. Big fella, isn't he? And Kudka. 70 feet long. Thanks for the follow. the scales at a substantial 35... 35 tons. Thank you, thank you for the follow, Kudka. I appreciate that. Yeah. And the answer says, that always blows my mind that grass is super recent. Oh, yeah. Dinosaurs would not have seen grass. So yeah, don't ever tell a Mesozoic dinosaur to touch grass, because they won't know what you're talking about. Um, grasses didn't evolve until the Cenozoic, the age of mammals that we're, we're in right now. Oh yeah, yeah, imagine a world without grasses. Imagine a world where, you know, 
know, landscapes would have looked like, uh... Looked something like this. But those claws on the wings are, once again, invaluable. And Mommy Does, 22 months. Thank you, thank you for the support, Mommy Does. I really appreciate that. Thank you kindly. It's good to have you here. Good to have your your ongoing support. It does mean a lot. Um, yeah. Environments like this. No grasses. Instead, you had various, like, lycophytes and, and club mosses and spike mosses and things growing on the ground. Horsetails and, and other kinds of fern... Cycads and conifers and ginkgos, plants and flora like that. Um, flowers didn't even exist until about halfway through the age of the dinosaurs. Until about the early Cretaceous, flowers did not yet exist. Today, about 90% of plant species on Earth are angiosperms. They are flowering plants. Those only first got their start about halfway through the age of dinosaurs. So those landscapes back then would have looked a lot different from today. No grasses is the first and foremost thing. So yeah. yeah. And cattails aren't grass? I think they are, Harry. That's not what I said, though. I said horsetails. Yeah. Horsetails, like equisetum. Um, yeah. Like these. Uh, no shame. No sign of disgrace or failure. Displacer. In fact, in a world full of changing environments and occasional catastrophe, all species eventually become extinct. I mean, yes and no, actually. Uh, it depends on how you define species. But if you're leaving descendants, then did your species ever truly go extinct? That's kind of a... I don't know, I almost feel like removing that alert. Because it is a little bit misleading. But yeah, it, it kind of denies the existence of anagenesis, I suppose. Anyway, horsetails like this are not grasses. Um, and they're not related to cattails, which are different. Yeah, these are, I think, a kind of grass? These are angiosperms. These did not exist during the time of the dinosaurs. But horsetails did. And they are very different. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. And moss is soft and nice. That's true, Charlie's Dragon. Yeah, moss is really cool. Um, and when did ferns come about? Ferns are some of the first... Um, how would I put that? I'm Again, I'm not a botanist. But ferns are among the first plants to develop um, like an exterior structure uh, to like help support themselves. Things like mosses don't have that. Um, in fact, I was actually watching a cool video about this earlier. Here we go. So we'll talk about that real quick. This, did you know an oak tree? Yeah, you know, I'll start you off at the beginning. Did you know an oak tree is way more closely related to a pumpkin than they are to pine trees? Look, here are the oaks next to the pumpkins, and here are the pine trees all the way over here. Yeah, the Before pine trees I made this are gymnosperms. Map, I thought that all of the trees evolved from each other, but it turns out the concept of a tree has evolved throughout history multiple times. In this Map of Plants video, I'm going to look at all of the different kinds of plants on Earth and how they're all related to each other. And I made this video with the help of the experts at the Royal Botanic Gardens queue here in London. And stuff. like all of my map videos, the post is available on my website, dosmaps.com. Good stuff. I'll give you a link to this later. But let's, grow, let's run to the vascular plants and ferns. Now, every plant we'll meet after this point has got a vascular structure. That's what Based I was thinking. Vascular structure is what I could remember. Yeah. around 420 million years ago. A vascular plant has specialized tissues called xylem and phloem, which yep. transport water and nutrients throughout its structures. These tissues are rigid and enable vascular plants to grow taller and more complex than the non-vascular plants we've seen so far. Yep. Now we get to club mosses and ferns. Club there mosses aren't true mosses because they have a vascular structure. But <laughs> also club mosses aren't ferns because they've got a different leaf structure to ferns and different DNA. So they're stuck <laughs> in the middle here on their own. Ferns include whisk ferns, horsetails, and leptosporangiate ferns, or leptosporangiate yeah. for short. 
the leptoferns are the things that you typically think of when you think of ferns. These are, you know, sword ferns and and deer tongue ferns and tree ferns. They're all leptoferns here. And they reproduce via spores, not via seeds. So they're different from seed ferns, which I guess under this schema wouldn't be true ferns. They'd be seed ferns. And these have many of the yeah. features we're familiar with from plants. Roots, a vascular structure, and true yep. leaves. I know this one right here. This is Dixonia antarctica, which is the Tasmanian tree fern. Um, beautiful, beautiful. One of my very favorite extant plants. And you see them in a lot of dinosaur films and stuff because they look very exotic. Um, Dixonia antarctica, the Tasmanian tree fern. Um, if you ever saw Walking with Dinosaurs, maybe you're, you're well familiar with these. They show up a lot in that series. Um, because they just, I think to a lot of people, they look prehistoric. And they do resemble closely some of the big ferns which existed during the time of the dinosaurs, during the Mesozoic. Um, these are very popular in people's front yards here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, the climate here is not too different from that of Tasmania. It's a bit drier here. But if you water these guys, they'll do fine. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, Leonosaura Leal Chow, exactly, Bradington, yes, yes. In, um, what was it, Spirits of the Ice Forest? Uh, um, there are tree ferns everywhere in this episode. There's one right there. That's Dixonia Antarctica, the Tasmanian tree fern. There's Lealanosaurus, like you were saying, Brannington. Um, this is the tree fern episode. But there's also tree ferns that show up in in the uh, the Morrison Formation episode, too. Um, the one with Diplodocus and all their friends. But yeah. And New Caledonia, yeah, absolutely, Brannington. Very cool. Um, and Rosanne, I've never been to Tasmania. Um... But I've heard very good things. I've heard it's a really, really cool place. Anyway. Two leaves called ferns. Yeah. However, they reproduce through spores and not seeds. Ferns yep. are a diverse group with over 10,000 known species inhabiting wow. various habitats worldwide, even underwater. Huh. The fossil record for ferns stretches back to 400 million years ago. And the yep, ancestors the Devonian, of today's ferns were giants towering up to 40 meters in height. The yep. earth was covered in forests of tree ferns. These have mostly cool. died out, but some tree ferns are still with us today. Mm -hmm. A quick side note, for this map I can't physically include every plant that exists. So I've chosen a familiar representative for each major group of plants. Anyway, if you'd like to watch the rest of this video, check it out right here. I just found this this morning. It's actually recommended to me by YouTube's algorithm. For once, I had a recommendation that made sense. Now I pass it along to you. Good video if you're interested in plants. Check it out. It's a really nice introduction to the modern diversity of plants. And I certainly learned a few things watching it. Um, and the magnolias came along and took over the world. Yeah, Nianza, yeah, yeah. Uh, around the beginning of... Uh, uh, not the beginning, but... For the early Cretaceous period. You had the first angiosperms arise, and then they just... They just kind of blitzkrieg the whole earth... Now they're everywhere. On six of Earth's seven continents. Um, oh, and very cool salamander. Popped up in your recommendations last week. Nice. Nice. I'm glad to see it. And I'm going to give it a thumbs up, too. Um, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. Yeah. And at least the cycads and ginkgo... Yeah, Neon's uh, two of my favorite plants. Cycads are... Uh, oh, man, they're neat. Here. Um, one of these days, we'll do a, a whole stream on... Um, Mesozoic plants. But, uh... Here, take a look at this from the Royal Institution of Australia. Oh, or maybe we'll take a look at this one. World's loneliest tree. I've seen this before. This is good stuff. This is the story of a plant. But not just any plant. It is... Ooh, I actually have a cycad from the same genus, Encephalartos. These are, like, um... They're Gondwanan. They are uh, mostly from Africa. There's a lot of Encephalartos species in South Africa. That's kind of their, their stronghold. It's the story today. of a plant that long, long ago 
once ruled the world. Apply yeah. that today, it's the very last of its kind. Hmm. It's this plant behind me, Encephalatus woodii, E woodii nice. for short, and I've been looking after it for over 20 years. <laughs> it was named for a British botanist, John Medley Wood, who in 1895 discovered it growing on a hillside on the coast of South Africa. A strange, handsome plant Ooh. caught his eye, and he carefully removed a small portion of it and had it shipped all the way to London. To here, Kew Gardens, where it's been, for the last 117 years, hmm. but it's here. I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm not totally sure, but I think. That's where it's been. The... I think this may have actually popped up in our little documentary that we we're watching about old Chucky e. D, about Charles Darwin, uh, last Monday. I think I was like, I was looking at him like that. That looks a lot like the, like the Conservatory of Flowers in in San Francisco, but no, it not quite. I think it's probably this. I think it's probably Kew Gardens. The last 117 years, but yeah. its history goes much, much further back. You see, Encephalatus woodii is what is known as a cycad. Yeah. And cycads have been around for 300 million years. As the millennium rolled on, cycads flourished, providing shade for triceratops, a perch for pterodactyls, and a tasty snack for brontosauruses. At one point during the Jurassic, cycads made up 20% of all the plants on Earth. They were everywhere. At every corner of the globe. But Including Antarctica. Good times couldn't last forever. The dinosaurs went extinct. Ice ages came and went. New um, now let's see. Neon says, imagine being a botanist and your last name is Wood. That's some... Uh, What's the concept? Nominative determinism, I think it's called. Here, let's let's look that up for a second. Um. Yeah, nominative determinism is a hypothesis that people tend to gravitate toward areas of work that fit their names. Um. Yeah, yeah. There apparently is like a, a disproportionate number of ichthyologists with the last name Fish. There's probably a disproportionate number of botanists with last names, or maybe even first names too. Uh, last names or first names. Probably very rare that it's both. That have things to do with plants. There is kind of an idea that like, if your last name is something interesting, then that might... You know, like, as you're growing and learning and developing into a full human being, that might have some influence on what you become interested in and the career that the career path that you choose. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Bob, car mechanic. There you go. <laughs> uh, there you go, Venice Lion. Welcome to paleontologizing, by the way. It's good to have you here. Anyway, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I know some geologists with the last name Rocks. I know a paleontologist with the last name Fowler, who's very into birds. Um, yeah, my old mentor back in Montana. Uh, can we find a video on this real quick? Here, let's try brain stuff, house stuff. Let's try this. I don't know. It's a shot in the dark, but maybe it'll be good. It hurts. Hey, oh, no, so Steely, everyone has a name. I have one. You have one. Everyone has one. And that's extraordinary when you think about it, because it's one of the very few social things that all human beings have in common. So you might be a, hmm. a Kevin, a Felicia, by a Muhammad, a Holly, and so on. This name is part of your identity, and it helps separate you from that teeming mass of humanity. But how much does your name affect you? Hmm. Could it determine your future? And this is relevant to today's topic as well. It ties back into dinosaurs and the early history of dinosaurs because 
the name dinosaur, which means terrible or fearfully great or awesome lizard or reptile, dinosaur, dinosauros, the fearfully great lizards, that was kind of determinative in that it kind of shaped the way that scientists thought about dinosaurs for a century after that name was first coined. And it still kind of does to a certain extent today. We're still carrying a little bit of that baggage, but it's, uh, it's interesting to think about. Well, it doesn't determine your life exactly. That's See, funny lady Steve feet. Levitt and <laughs> Roland Fryer studied decades worth of children's names only to find that what your parents name you doesn't really impact your economic future. Congratulations, huh. you're not gonna be doomed to poverty just because your name is, you know, Ernest or something. But your name certainly will affect your future. See, a study called Are Emily and Greg More Employable Than Lakeisha and Jamal unearthed at least one disturbing trend about names. And it's this. This is step-by-step step guide to becoming a fossil. Tommy Plotticus. Step one, die. Thank you for the 14 months. 14 whole months. I'm no math guy, but I'd say that's almost a year. I th think you're probably right there, Tommy Plotticus. Thank you so much for the ongoing support. 14 months is a, it's a good while. Thank you, thank you for keeping me online for that long. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Unearthed at least one disturbing trend about uh. names, and it's this. Job applicants with equal qualifications Tradition. or even otherwise identical resumes are about 50% more likely to get a call back if they have, get this, a white sounding name. This indicates that despite numerous laws, discrimination still thrives in the workplace. Your name yeah. doesn't just tell people about you. It tells people about your parents and it gives them a way to, you know, place you in their vision of society. And this isn't about whether their vision is correct. That's a prejudice. But it does affect how people with these expectations and mindsets will address and interact with you. And that's not all. Your name may also play a role in your career. This theory is weird. It's called... And then, let's see. Dinosaur Dave says, do you think Paki Poda would have... Uh, would have had, if that was the name used as a, oh, I don't think that, um, I don't think dinosaurs would be quite as popular today if we called them pachypods instead of dinosaurs. There's something beautiful about the name dinosaur. It's, it's evocative and unique and just... And the same with it, I think Tyrannosaurus, Tyrannosaurus Rex is probably the greatest name that anybody's ever given a dinosaur. Henry Fairfield Osborne may have been a third-rate scientist, but he was a first-rate namer of, of New Taxa. And uh, I think that's a huge part of why Tyrannosaurus became so very popular, is just that name, Tyrannosaurus Rex, King of the Tyrant Lizards. That name is just like, oh, it's like a meal, you know? You just, you just want to bite into it. It's uh, it's pretty excellent. It's pretty excellent. And likewise, the word dinosaur is just a wonderful word. Um, and Silas says, is the suffix dino related to the suffix dina in dynamic or dynasty? I don't think so. Um, but I, I could be wrong about that. Yeah... Um, anyway, Mommy Does says, One of the amazing things about dinosaurs is that no one needs to know Latin for the names themselves to evoke emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, and there you go, Brannington. Yeah, agreed. Let's continue here. Called nominative determinism, the idea that your name may affect the way you interact with the world, including anything from donations to your choice of career. So, for example, <laughs> is someone named Helen Painter more likely to be an artist? Or is someone named Jimmy Hogg more likely to work with pigs? Matthew Mirenberg and John Jones think so. In their study, let's see if I can get this right. Why Susie Sells Seashells by the Seashore, Implicit Egotism and Major Life Decisions. It's long, but that's the title. These hmm. researchers found that people are more likely to choose careers whose labels resemble their own names. So, to use one huh. of their examples, people named Dennis or Denise are overrepresented among, can you guess? Oh, Dennis, Denise, um...
uh, excavating dens. I think that's probably what it is. Yeah. Excavating dens. Um, you know, like, like burrows. Spot on. Dentists. Mirrenberg. Oh. I'm totally kidding. I knew it was going to be that. And Jones believe this happens because people prefer things that they connect with themselves, including their names. Other scientists, huh. like University of Pennsylvania's Uri Simonson, are skeptical about this whole idea. You know, are we Dendrology in the case it's conclusions not <laughs> where none exist just to support a neat thought? Now, we haven't even talked about name changes yet, or the weird name changes people have tried in court. And yes. I'm looking at you, Roman CEO, Sir Tasty Max Billion. And we also haven't talked about the multi-generational popularity cycle. That There's a guy up in Alaska. Um, I think he might live in, does he live in North Pole, Alaska? I forget. But um, I think he's he's like running for Congress or something, but he changed his name to Santa Claus. <laughs> and he's, he actually seems like a really cool guy. Anybody here know about him? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so like he's, his name would show up on the ballot as Santa Claus. Um, and he also like grew a big white beard and everything. And, uh, oh goodness. We're going further down a, uh, a den here. We're digging a, another den, you know, like a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, yeah, here we go. Where's the, where's the audio? Don't tell me there's no audio. See the children who live here. It's their future we're talking about. Um, this guy's actually pretty cool, I think. Yeah. Uh, ho, ho, ho! Meet Santa Claus. Yes, that's his <laughs> real name, and he's coming to a council near you. That's if you live in the North Pole. The rosy-cheeked 68-year-old has been elected as a city councilman in Alaska. And in true Christmas spirit, he prides himself on being an advocate for children. I like to keep accomplishing as much as I can on behalf of children, especially vulnerable children in dire straits. So I'm trying to use my time wisely. I use it to benefit as many children as I possibly can. Santa Claus <laughs> legally changed his name from Thomas Patrick O'Connor about a decade ago while living in Nevada. <laughs> and while he wore a trademark red velvet outfit during his campaign, he doesn't own any reindeer. He <laughs> does, however, have some little helpers. My naughty and nice list is fairly comprehensive. The elves <laughs> update it all the time, and I have my own personal opinions on others behavior not that mine is perfect either but santa claus will take office later this month unlike his namesake he doesn't accept requests for presents believing that the greatest gift people can give is love hmm. um he does seem like a really cool guy and that uh yeah he was running against sarah palin for alaska's open u.s house seat um yeah, I, don't, I his values I think align pretty closely with my own, and um, very much against those. <laughs> Sarah Palin. <laughs> oh boy. Um, yeah, yeah. Lenina, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you here. Hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, here, get back to nominative determinism. We'll finish this, then we'll go back to the, uh, the Psycat video. But names experience, or we'll merge like back to the surface the after our fall, rabbit holes here. Britneys and Ashleys, but let me know what you think. Oh. What do you think your name says about you? Yeah, what does your name say about you, Twitch chat? Um, we choose our names here, so, uh, it's usually pretty, pretty easy to talk about. But, uh, anyway. Yeah. Claire means light or the one who sees light. That's pretty cool, Claire. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like dinosaurs, my name is Tommy. That makes sense. Tommy Plotticus. That's pretty self-explanatory. Avalon Angel says, I like plants. Well, well, well. We're talking about a plant right now. No, uh, 
Here. Much further back. Cycads. You see, Encephalatus woodii is what is known as a cycad. And cycads have been around for 300 million years. As the millennium oh, rolled gotcha, on, okay. cycads flourished, providing shade for triceratops, a perch for pterodactyls. Dino Danny, that makes sense. Welcome back, by the way. Mm. At yeah. one point during the Jurassic, cycads made up 20% of <laughs> all the plants on Earth and covered every corner of the globe. But the good times couldn't last forever. The dinosaurs went extinct. Except for birds. Ice ages came and went. New modern plants like conifers and fruit trees started pushing cycads out, and the once proud population of E. woody eyes were reduced and reduced mm. and reduced until there was possibly only one left, one single solitary E. woody eye growing quietly on a hillside. Which brings us right back to John Medley Wood. At the time, he had no way of knowing just how rare his discovery was. But expedition after expedition in search of more E. woodii have proved fruitless. You see, huh. cycads are dioecious, meaning yeah, you need meaning male, and female. male and female plants to create a new one. And this one happens to be a male, a true lonely bachelor. If a female oh. mate cannot be found, it really will be the last of its kind. To this day, researchers are still looking. After all, it's a big world and might just be a chance. In the meantime, he'll have me to keep him company. Oh. <laughs> um, I'll give you a link to this wonderful little video there. Cycads. Honestly, my favorite plants as a group. Um, but yeah, yeah, grass always makes it. Yeah, Tommy Platicus, me too, me too. Um, which uh, reminds me of this. Um, yeah. What's so unusual about life on our planet is that we have natural history, like real animals shot in the wild doing incredible behaviors sitting right next to prehistoric monsters, dinosaurs, crazy creatures from the past. Good stuff. If you haven't seen this yet, I would recommend it. But this is the most tricky thing is... We're here to do, well, super high-tech VFX sequence, and so we've got all the toys. The most tricky thing about trying to film a, a sequence that's supposed to be during the Mesozoic that was finding places with no grass. They were like, oh, it must be really boring filming back plates, but I don't see it as that. I see it as we're filming a very complex, dynamic behavioral sequence. We're imagining the creatures, which I enjoy doing. I don't have any problem imagining a T Rex running through the forest. And so translating that and doing something that no one had done before, which is to deep. film dynamic, <laughs> natural history style shots of these creatures moving through the landscape, is really exciting and a really good challenge. And yeah, great fun. Best fun I've ever had. Throughout visual effects, there's a point at which you're filming nothing and you have to get I, di I didn't skip the part with the no i don't think i did um yeah like that, 10 centimeters so to help with them um, getting them in shot and kind of visualizing them we've got these really amazing little cardboard ones we're just going to pop them in shot so we can make sure everything looks good and they're all lined up properly smile Okay, so if we get shot 140, right. Other mouth remember works when they leave the nest, there's a point where we want them to go from being on all fours to taking those sort of little steps up into bipedal. On location, yeah. VFX is 90% gardening because you have to remove grass, you have to tidy it up, you have to like sort the scene out to make it all work. Basically, all yep. the twigs this side behind them need to come out. Oh, and I think, shoot, it wasn't here, it was... Um... Uh, let's see. It was the making of walking with dinosaurs. That was the, uh, the, tr yeah. Hmm. I 
I think it's here. Three million pounds. Three years in the making. Brought you the story of evolution as it's never been seen before. I wonder if I'm able to find this real quick. But it's just a, a soundbite where they're talking about uh, walking with dinosaurs and they're talking about um, how difficult it was to find the proper locations that didn't have grasses. Because grasses today are ubiquitous. You find them all over the world. And it's really, really tricky to find places to film that don't have grasses. You know? It might have been in here. Um... Let's try this. Didn't do that 65 million years ago. It was quite a warm climate. So that's what was needed. Places where dinosaurs would feel at home. Yep. These days Isn't they it? are pretty hard to find. It has oh, been yeah. a complete nightmare trying to find locations. And if I had to put my finger on one reason, it's grass. Grass never appeared in dinosaur times, and yep. grass is all over this world. And even when we find wonderful trees, there's always grass in there amongst them. And you want a bit of clear area to stick your dinosaur, and you'll find grass. There are, though, still places where the right habitats exist. In the course of making the series, the film crew travels far and wide to locations that reflect what the world was like back in the time of dinosaurs. The Triassic of 220 New million Caledonia, years ago right? was discovered in the eerie setting of New Caledonia. Beautiful, as someone in chat was mentioning earlier. Jurassic Giants yeah. was found in the redwood forests of California. Yeah, just north of and where I live. The lava fields of Chile were a match for the Cretaceous of 65 million years ago. Steely Dan, sure. Feeding her... Although, although cannabis is not a kind of grass, it's related to, um, I think it's related to roses. I think it's part of Rosiaceae. Young. And she lived just at the end of the time of dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus was only around for the last two million years. And to film it, we've come to this place, which is in Chile. And there's an ideal forest here because what we have is a low, scrubby Nothofagus, which is a southern beach, came along just at the end of the time of dinosaurs. And behind it, this wonderful Araucaria forest or monkey puzzle. Now, monkey puzzles have been around since before the time of the dinosaurs. So the combination yep. is ideal. But what makes it really special is it's on an old ash field because of a nearby volcano. And there's no grass here because of that. So it all fits together to be the right sort of background for Tyrannosaurus. Can you reach Beautiful. over enough? Well, yeah. yeah. That's good. Now the eyes. Um... Yeah, Charlie's Dragon says monkey puzzle trees, much older than monkeys or puzzles. Yes, I agree. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, what do you say we start getting into our, uh... Oh, hello, Moon Pie. Would you like to come say hello? Would you like to say hello to the chat? Come here. Yeah. Come here. Right, we might have a, a quick cat visit here. Come here, Moon Pie. Hey. Look here where everybody can see you. Understand the the phrase herding cats. You know they do not like to. Come here. They're not the most cooperative of it. Oh, there we go. Oh, Moon Pie. What are you doing? Are you bored right now? Yeah. Well, Lordy and Ios are gonna be home this evening, so you can get more attention from them too. Yeah. Come on up here, Moon Pie. There you go. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Moon Pie. Moon Pie. Yeah. No, you're a 
little lonely. I'm sorry. I'm glad you came to say hello, though. Tissue, you got you got got mocos on your face. Got some mocos, as my dad would say. Yeah. Oh. And there you go, Steely Dan. Yeah, that's that's why she's called Moon Pie. It's because she's she's cream filled like that. Yeah. Oh, Moon Pie. You're shedding so much. I just brushed you so thoroughly the other day. You've already got so much more fur to get rid of. Goodness. No, oh, it's in my mouth. No. Oh. It's just going everywhere. Why do you produce so much hair? Huh? Why do you do that? Much hair. So much. You've got more hair than I do. Whoops. That's an accomplishment. Huh. You're loving this right now. We gotta just, like, take all the hair that we get on stream and put it into a big jar, and then when the jar's all full, then we have a pizza party or something. Huh, Moon Pie? That sound good? Do you like pizza? I know you don't. I like pizza, though. Yeah. Uh, shedding her winter coat? Yeah, it is, like, it does feel like springtime here in the Bay Area, but she's an inside cat, and so she wouldn't know that. I don't know, I just think she produces a lot of fur, and yeah, we're trying not to let that turn into hairballs. Yeah. Oh. Man, look how cats like to scrape the sides of their teeth on you. Bite me. What are you doing? You're getting too excited. That almost hurt. Alright, I think it might be time you go on your jolly way, Moon Pie. Comes up and she wants to be pet, and then you pet her, and then she like, she's purring and purring, and then she just lashes out. And then she comes right back. Moon Pie, if you're gonna lash out, then you know, you can remove yourself from the situation. I'm not gonna get up and move. I'm streaming right now. We need to work on our conflict resolution, I think. And those claws on the wings are, once again, invaluable. Orchestran! Yeah. It's true, Orchestran. Thank you for the 22 months of support. Holy cow. And, uh... Jayco! of this happening are so slim they are impossible yeah. to But then on top of that, to actually find the fossil makes the world of the dinosaur hunter the world of the long shot. It's true, oh, Jaco. Thank you for these six months of support there, Jaco. I really appreciate it. Thank you for supporting science. science here on Twitch for the past six months. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, oh, when I saw that gimp, like, yeah, sexual dimorphism and ornithomimosaurs, they were talking about the proportions of the limb bones, like the thickness of the limb bones. I'm not sure I buy it, but that was while I was in the field last summer, I think. Um. Yeah, yeah. Um. And... 
And there you go, Casey Snowart. Yeah, we're still working on that with Moonpie. She uh, she hasn't quite gotten the message yet. But yeah. Anywho, um, where were we? We were talking about plants. Um, we we're talking about Moonpie. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh wow. What a what a what a world we live in. Um Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of, of moon pies. Um <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> It's <laughs> not so much funny as it is long. Kind of like this. Hmm. <laughs> I don't remember that part. <laughs> that was the whole point of this video. Let me watch it again. By gum, it worked. I've awakened in the future. Moon pie. What a time to be alive. <laughs> There's the punchline, folks. That's why we sat through that that clip. I hope you enjoyed. Anyway, classic Simpsons. Here's a uh, here's a link. Um, and that should be an alert, Lenina. That should one million percent be an alert. Um, moon pie. of time, etc. Um, good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Nell says, I eagerly await, expect and await the discovery of the hidden fourth pie. Pewdie, yes. Pewdie pie. The, uh, The, what's, what's the name? What's the phrase? 
the hidden, the hidden pot, like the hidden imam. <laughs> yes, the revelation of the hidden pie. Cutie pie. But yeah, yeah. Um, a red cat named Apple, says Casey's. I don't think we're going to get any more cats. I think we're at capacity right now with, with three. We have as many cats living in this house as we have people. And we already have... Like, we don't really have more space for litter boxes, honestly. We would need to get at least a couple more litter boxes. Yeah. Oh, come on. That wasn't that funny. It's your basic pun there. Anyway. Shall we get to the topic at hand for today's stream? We're only an hour and 13 minutes into stream. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's talk about Megalosaurus here. Megalosaurus is a pretty important critter. Um, yeah. And thank you, Nell, for the hydrate. Here, give me, give me a second. Here. Um, let's talk about M -m -m Megalosaurus. Which, oh, it's not in this one. Um, oh, goodness. That would be, um, it's not in the PBS series. I just looked. It's got to be in the one with, um, uh, with Walter Cronkite. Yes, indeed. Here, let's just go to the beginning of this one. It's good stuff. I think you're going to like it. Yeah, Walter Cronkite. Yes, indeed. Now. Um, also voiced by... It may not by... seem like much. 500 bits goes a long way towards supporting science. I'll click here on Twitch. Thank you. Thank you, Delta Rain. I really appreciate those 500 bits. Thank you kindly. Hope you're having a good day, Delta. It's good to see you as always. Um, yeah, Kron it's he's also uh, the same guy as, as David Putty from uh, from Seinfeld. No, he's not. I'm kidding. Uh, good stuff. And that park is outside of London today, Pfizer. Yes, indeed. Take a look. Um, take a look at this. Now, Crystal Palace Park in southeast London is famous for its dinosaurs, these huge statues lurking around the lake. They were created by a Victorian sculptor, so they're not entirely accurate, but they are much <laughs> loved. However, one of them... They're... Accuracy is, is kind of not the point. I mean, we knew next to nothing about these animals at the time. Dinosaurs were brand new. They're only known from a handful of bones. You can look at them and laugh at them, but they're... At the time, this was the cutting edge of science. These were exquisite by the standards of the day. For only having a handful of bones, understanding that these animals walked upright with pillar-like limbs, that they were dynamic, active animals, like... It's astonishing that they even got that right, you know? Suffered yeah. a mishap during lockdown. Jim Weeble reports on a rather unusual facelift. Hmm. When finished in 1854, these concrete giants were cutting edge, the like never seen before. So when a hundred kilogram chunk fell off the Megalosaurus in Crystal Palace Park. This is our dinosaur today, Megalosaurus. In fact, it's the very bit of the Megalosaurus which we have right here that fell off of that model. The distal end of the denary there, the lower jaw. Last May, Hearts sank as a disfigured face looked on. Fitting that modern technology came to the rescue. White line scanning created a millimeter perfect image. Yeah. Giving birth to the past, a 3D printer creates a new jaw overnight. Yep. Fresh Beautiful. out of the oven, next to the paint job. So at the moment we're painting it to match the, the weathered historic one. You can see here with the Pfizer says, can you make them a replacement? Oh, they're way ahead of me there. They already did it. 
and they did it through 3D printing. Historic. It's made of uh, early Portland cement and tile uh, backings to, to reinforce it, as opposed to the, the new prosthesis, which is hollow and plastic. Now you can see the Megalosaurus behind me looking in a pretty sorry state without its jaw. It's the moment of truth now. Is it all going to fit? How do you feel, Tim? Do you feel confident? Oh, really confident. Now, I'm not an expert in these things, but I'd say that is a fairly cracking first fix. Look at that. For those the who wonders raised of 3D money printing along scanning. with Bromley Council and then secured COVID recovery funding, it's a good day. Yeah. So happy, really, really happy. I really noticed that people don't take photographs of it anymore, which is really quite sad. So <laughs> it'd be nice to see people um, engaging with the sculpture, taking photographs of it and enjoying it again, because I feel like um, it being broken made people not enjoy it so much. So it would be really nice to see people enjoying the sculpture again. The suspicion yeah. is that damage was caused by people jumping the fence and climbing on it for fun. Some of those who protect them are pleading for people not to do. The so the Megalosaurus can stay intact for another century. Jim Weeble, BBC London. And let's hope so. Yeah, I'll give you a link to that video right there, but it's really nice that there are good, passionate people who work to preserve these pieces of, of important dinosaur science history there. You know? Yeah. Um... And Pope20232 says the Arctic has to have, like, the best fossils up there, right? No, uh-uh. Are they just not easily accessible? I mean, much of the Arctic is just ice with no land underneath. Like, the North Pole uh, is just sea ice. And there's no rocks there to find fossils in. There are fossils within the Arctic Circle, and some of them are really important, but... That's one of the, the the worst places to look for fossils just because it's so inhospitable. And there's often ice covering things, even if there is rock underneath. Um, but yeah, what if, would happen if something died and got covered in ice? That does happen in, in places like Siberia, Pope, but it has to be very recent because ice up there is new. There was no ice there during the age of the dinosaurs, for the most part. Um, ice is fairly new up there. You know, when we knew that global global sea levels were a lot higher, it's because there wasn't ice in the Arctic or the Antarctic. So all of that water was just in the ocean, and that's what raised global, you know, global sea levels to the point where. Um, Here. Let's look at, for instance, uh, 90 million years ago. Be a good example there. When there was no ice up in the North Pole, or indeed the South Pole, the middle of the United States was just completely inundated by, by what we call the Western Interior Seaway. Much of California also flooded. There's no Florida yet. Much of the East Coast. Um, Oklahoma. Uh, Kansas. Nebraska. South and North Dakota. Saskatchewan and, and Alberta. Just... Yeah. Um, the ice that's in the Arctic and the Antarctic is fairly new. Um, Earth temperatures have gone up and down a lot over its history. But all the ice that's up north and down south today is less than 50 million years old. Um, yeah, Antarctica does definitely have very cool fossils under the ice. Absolutely, Pope. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a neat documentary about that if you're curious. I'll give you a link to it. Um, there. To become the um, let's start it from the beginning. Antarctica. 
a frozen continent at the end of the earth. Yeah, that ice is fairly new in the grand scheme of things. Of animals and plant life. But millions of years ago, it was a land of great dinosaurs. Yep. Inhabiting a lush, forested ecosystem. Here, agile Antarctic predators hunted fleet footed prey. There's a link to that there. This huge continent was also a refuge for hardy beasts that survived a great mass extinction. The one that paved the way for the dinosaurs. That's a Lystrosaurus there. And giant pre dinosaur reptiles weighing over a ton. Like Erythrosuchus, I think. Very cool. Into this lost world, travel a team of scientists. Cool stuff. Yeah. Hoping to unearth the secrets of Antarctica's mysterious past. Good stuff. Yeah, um... And Pope says, have you ever seen that gigantic centipede? Why is this one? Centipede. Oh, do you mean the giant millipede? Arthropleura? Yeah, not a centipede, but a millipede. These guys were big. They were big. Um, like right there? Yeah. Yeah, I actually did a live stream from... Let's see... The Burpee Museum of Natural History in Rockford, Illinois. And they've got a big Arthur Pleura model there streamed this at one point in um, I think this would have been June of 2022 I think yeah anyway cool stuff and Amy says would it be possible for people to do digs in the Antarctic no that that's happened I mean you're, you're seeing footage of that here to venture into the most challenging place to search for fossils on Earth. Very cool. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, again, here's a link to that video if you'd like to watch it. But yeah, yeah. And, uh... Kagir Jack, thank you for the follow. Kagir, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Good stuff. Let me get rid of some of these excess tabs here. Make Chrome run a little bit more sloop smoothly, let's hope. And we will continue our discussion of Megalosaurus here. Oh, after we do our game of Metazoa. Shoot. Let's get into that. I've almost, uh, I almost forgot. Um, we gotta figure out what today's mystery animal is. Somebody give me the name of a placental mammal. We'll start off with a placental mammal today. Um, and we'll see if we can get... Wolf, that's a good one, Sparky Pugwash. I like that. A carnivorin? Let's try wolf. And, uh, oh boy. Okay. Not a wolf. Not a mammal. Uh, but it is a tetrapod. It's an amniote. Let me show you what I mean from that. Here we go. Um, let's jump to the amniotes. So, it is an amniote which is a non-amphibian tetrapod. Tetrapods are vertebrate animals that live on land, except when they don't. Um, amphibians are one group of tetrapod, but amniotes are tetrapods that do not include amphibians. And that's what this critter is. Our mystery animal is an amniote. We guessed wolf, and it didn't give us mammal, it gave us amniota, which tells us 
that it's not a mammal, so we can knock out 5,000 species there. It's instead going to be a seropsid. Seropsids are reptiles in the common parlance. But birds are also a kind of reptile. They are seropsids as well. And so... Yeah. Here, we could try a... Golgonex says a hawk. Let's try that. Let's try and knock out the birds here. Let's see. Oh, okay, good, good, good. It is a neonath. It is a neonath bird, but it's not a hawk. Here, let's go to hawks right here. The Aceptoriformes. Hawks right there. Which I think also includes eagles and kites and vultures and osprey. So we know it's none of them. In fact, it's not going to belong to this clade either. Or this clade. We've got to go all the way back to the base of Neonaths. It could be a fowl species here. In fact, it probably is. Give me the name of a fowl. A duck or a chicken or a quail or a peacock. Hmm. A duck! says Pope. You can try duck. But first, Harissa. Ontogeny. Holy cow, Harissa. 29 months of support there. That is extraordinary, Harissa. Thank you, thank you for your ongoing support of science outreach here on Twitch. It makes a difference. It really does. Thank you, thank you for that. Good stuff. Good stuff. Holy cow. Um, here, let's, let's try duck on here and see if that gets us anywhere close. Duck. And, no, shoot. This is not great. We're developing a polytomy here, and this is not what we want. Um, yeah. So we know it's a neonate bird, but it's not a hawk. Oh boy, this could be a tricky one. Um, so we, we can tell it's not a member of the fowl group, but it is a neonate. Presumably it's not part of this clade? Let's, let's take a look. So passerine birds are like sparrows and their relatives. And Sataco passeres includes the passerine birds and the parrots. And you falcon amorphe includes them and falcons as well. Broader than that, we get to Australavies, which includes passerines, parrots, and falcons, as well as Seriamas and terror birds. Telluravies also includes creatures like the red-tailed hawk and their relatives, as well as the European robin and their relatives too, yeah. But more broadly than that, Passerea, it's probably not a Passerean bird, although it might be. You don't know how many of these subgroups this game has in it, and that makes it really complicated for somebody who actually knows a thing or two about taxonomy. Sometimes knowing too much can actually hamper you, because you expect the game to know as much as you do, and it and it doesn't sometimes. So... That's frustrating. Let's search Hummingbird. Maybe that'll get us somewhere close. Nope. Uh-uh. We've just got a big polytomy forming here, which is not ideal. Oh, boy. Let 
Let's try penguin, I guess. Let's try emperor penguin. Nope, we are we are hemorrhaging guesses here. This is not great. This is not great. Um It's not giving us any any further clade information here, which makes me think that neonates are like this is as specific as it gets, unless maybe you get down to the like granular family level or something. Oh boy. Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. But Werewolf Cast, thank you, thank you for subscribing. Welcome to Paleontologizing. I know you've been here, but thank you for that pledge of ongoing support. That means a great deal to me. Thank you, thank you for that. It's wonderful. Thank you for that pledge to support science here on Twitch. That's, uh... It's good stuff. Appreciate you. Holy cow. Um, gotta support the science. I appreciate that very much, Ruffle and Rural Cast. I really do. Yeah, what about flamingos? So, that's the problem, is that neonate birds... This clade right here includes most of our birds. How many species? Right there, how many species of neonates are there? so many there's the paleonate birds which are ostriches cassowaries tinamous etc there's only 61 species of them so it's telling us neonates for here and it's like it's it's almost like it it's this game is missing the subcategories which would help us narrow it down so it just comes down to blind guessing which is really um Kind of annoying it's not ideal i'm trying to like knock out these major clades of neonate birds here and it's not it's not helping us at all it's not registering that um yeah all these different clades here it's just not really like let's protect our fossils because if they're removed america loses them forever hybrid robotics thank you thank you holy cow for subscribing I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you for that, Hybrid Robotics. Thank you for your pledge of, of ongoing support to also support science. science here on Twitch. Excellent. You and Werewolf Cass will now be able to use these emotes whenever you please. All across Twitch for as long as you stay subscribed. Um, good stuff. Thank you, thank you for that support. I really do appreciate it. And now that we got the Partner Plus program, now that we're in that, after reaching that, that threshold, um, this channel now gets 70% of every, every sub. A better revenue split, not just a 50-50 split with Twitch, we now get 70% of every sub. So every person who subscribes at Tier 1, Tier 2, or Tier 3, 70% of that goes directly towards science outreach and communication, directly towards supporting this channel and this community. So it's, it's, a, it's an excellent bang for your buck. So yeah, yeah. Um, Hybrid Robotics says, I've always been fascinated by dinosaurs. I just never knew much about them. I discovered you from a raid by a channel I was on at the time. Oh, well, I'm so glad you're here, and thank you for that. Thank you for, for putting your money where your mouth is. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm happy to be able to support real science. I, You're keeping this young scientist off the streets here. With, uh, with that support, so thank you, Hybrid Robotics. Thank you very, very much for that. I deeply appreciate it. Good stuff. Uh, 
Um, there are there are so many different birds that this could be right now, and it's frustrating that the game is not narrowing it down any further. Um, let's. I don't know. Shoot. I don't, I don't know if it has a smaller subcategory other than neonates here. It'd be nuts if it didn't, but it really kind of doesn't seem like it. Um, yeah. Should we try, like, quail? They don't have quail. They don't have heron. Uh, we tried penguin. We didn't try a gull yet. We tried duck, we tried a hawk, we tried hummingbird, we tried emperor, penguin. Let's try gull? There we go. <laughs> Somehow we managed to get it in six guesses. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, they need more bird clades. They absolutely do, Lenina. So, like, we were just basically guessing blindly because they weren't narrowing it down among these these different groups of birds. By the way, if you're interested in, um... in learning these different groups of birds, um... Dude, who was it who had this... We have this wonderful poster here. Um, Tree of Birds by Albertinicus. There we go. Um, there we go. Albert Chen, and he is an evolutionary biologist. He's a paleontologist. He has been studying birds, so modern birds and the evolution of birds in the fossil record. So, Albert, welcome. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. And uh, you are also an artist, and you've done this amazing poster <laughs> that we're going to be looking at here quite a bit today. And I, yeah, I'm very excited for this conversation. This is we're going to be talking about why incredible. it is that uh, birds survived while, uh, you know, the dinosaurs went the way of the dinosaurs. I mean, well, technically birds are dinosaurs, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. you know. You, the other dinosaurs. You, you yeah. know what I mean. Yeah. What a cool yeah. so, phylogeny uh, here. Well, let's just start by talking about about, about yourself. So you've got, you've got quite the online presence. A lot of people know you from your art. And, yeah, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you go. And then I, yeah, yeah you, you've. You've done some speaking at uh, the, the Tet Zoo. Um, and yes. there's, there's some Mayor Space. I'm familiar with Clint's yeah. reptiles. Yes, indeed. But yeah, yeah. Tell us about how you got into your line of, of research. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I would say in terms of my interest in the subject of evolutionary biology, uh, that's probably something that goes about as far back as I can remember. I've always been interested yeah. In animals, I've always been interested in natural history, so how animals live and how they came to be. And so I think as long as I've had a sense of what biological evolution is, this is something I've been interested in. Um, Good stuff. Anyway, the uh, link to that video again is right there for you. Good stuff. Um, oh, and this whole channel, John Perry... He does really, really good work. And uh, here is a link to this wonderful poster here, which 
Man, if I were still working in uh, in that print shop that I worked in a few years ago, when I could print large scale you know, like posters for free, rather than paying hundreds of dollars for it, uh, I would I would if I knew about this back then I would have printed it in a heartbeat. Holy cow! Yeah, good stuff. And werewolf cast, yes indeed. There you go. Yeah, Sparky Pogwatch says it always amazes me how many different birds there are. I mean, how many are there? Over 9, There's over 9,000 species of living bird. Um, Pope said something like, could you imagine if birds took over the world? I mean, they, they did. They have. Birds do rule the world. There are twice as many bird species as there are mammal species, you know? This isn't the age of mammals, this is the age of birds! You might argue if you were an ornithologist. And then the bacteriologists would be laughing quietly to themselves. Because how many species are there of bacteria, you know? But yeah, yeah. Um. But yeah, birds are incredibly diverse. Highly specious. You know? Let's take a look at this. Ooh. Oh, this is gonna be cool. I've never seen this before. My name is Jane Kim, and I am an artist, a scientific illustrator, and the creator of Inkwell Studio. Ever since I was a little girl, I have loved animals, and especially to recreate them through art. Our next project is a collaboration with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and it is to create a mural that will depict the remarkable beauty of all 231 families of birds. Holy cow. Along with their ancestors dating back 400 million years ago. Very cool. It's a huge project, and we've spent the last 12 months sketching each animal out on paper. Holy cow. That's almost a whole year. The only mural in the world that depicts all of the families of birds in one place. Uh, at least it was until we had um. Until we had this. Um. Very cool stuff. Yeah. Anyway, neat. Oh, look at that. Oh, a physical mural. Oh, man, that's going to be awesome. I love to bring birds to life like the New Zealand.
Birds are all around us in everyday life. But most of the time we hardly even notice them. Thursday Birds Day is a step toward correcting this oversight. Do you want to be part of Thursday Birds Day? I don't know. Here's how you can contribute. Go outside during the week and pay special attention to the birds around you. See if you can take a picture of a bird. It doesn't have to be a good picture, any old photo will do. Upload the picture to the Discord and we will discuss it on Thursday. Simple as that. Thursday Birds Day is an invitation to go outside and appreciate the grandeur of the natural world. It's a reminder that, since birds are theropods, dinosaurs still enrich our daily lives. It's great! And finally, it's a celebration of the amazing history of life on our planet. So, happy Thursday Birds Day! Yes, indeed, that is Thursday Birds Day, which is coming up again like it always does this Thursday. So tune in that. We'll be talking all about birds. And I'll be uh, going over the rest of that mural video, which seems seems super, super awesome. Um, seems super awesome indeed. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, oh, and Lenina, yeah, good point. For Thursday Birds Day, your pics or videos should be one that you or a loved one have taken, ideally. Yeah, we'd, we'd like this to be a, you know, a homemade kind of a deal. Yeah, again, it doesn't even have to be a good photo. Um, yeah, it, it's more important that, that you went outside and took it yourself, you know, that's kind of the point. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you're gonna have to go outside tomorrow then? Yeah, go for it, Salamander, go for it. We want to see what birds you encounter. Absolutely. I know there are, there are so many, especially for Twitch viewers, there are so many different forces that are arrayed against us that try and keep us inside, try and keep us from enjoying the natural world around us, try and keep us from getting fresh air outdoors and, and appreciating wonderful natural world and so Thursday Birds Day is it's then a nudge in the other direction like you know if you can if, you're, if it's possible spend some time outside see if you can take a picture of a bird it could be a pigeon or a gull or a house sparrow or whatever whatever birds you encounter they still count they're still birds and birds are living dinosaurs and that's what we celebrate on Thursday Birds Day so yeah. What about if it's raining? Then uh, put a shower cap over your camera, Miss Yvette, so it doesn't get ruined in the rain. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, you posted grackles for like five weeks in a row, and I appreciated the heck out of that, Lenina. That's good stuff. Yeah. Grackles are... they are birds. They count. It doesn't, you don't have to always take a picture of the most beautiful, you know, roseate spoonbill, or the most elusive southern cassowary, or something like that. Like, it can be, it can literally be a filthy pigeon that's, that's eating a hot dog. Um, you know, perched on top of a dumpster. It does, it's still a bird. It still counts, and we can still appreciate it. That's kind of the whole point of Thursday Birds Day, you know? Yeah. Um. But yeah. Yeah. And no vision on the bird, only the song. That still counts, Salamander. We had a beautiful picture of some bird footprints in the snow. That counts. Like, if there's... If a bird poops on your car, you can take a picture of that. Don't put your license plate in it, but take a picture of the bird poop on your windshield and post that. And that'll give us a springboard to talk about 
Why do birds poop in like a paste kind of a form? And when did that first evolve? And did non-avian dinosaurs do the same thing? The point is to capture photographic evidence of a bird or something that a bird has done. That's it, you know? It counts. Yeah. Hybrid Robotics says it shows how wildlife has adapted to live in our concrete cities. And we wish more species could have survived, yeah. Yeah. And the ones that do survive and thrive, it's interesting to think about them and, like, what is it about them that has allowed them to do that? Always, always fun to talk about. Yeah. The turkey vultures fighting over a snake. Yeah, that was super cool, Lenina. That was super cool. Yeah. Um... Steely Dan says, I submitted a pic of a grackle outside a Taco Bell. Ooh. I'm, I'm partial to Taco Bell myself. Taken from my car, the quality standards are accessible. Yes, indeed, Steely Dan. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Anywho, we had we had goal for, uh, for today's Metazoo. And you know what? Um... We almost, well, we talked about this a little bit last Thursday, Bird's Day, and we're going to talk about it now, because how often do you get gull as your Metazoo animal? Um, but gulls are considered sacred in, um, in the U.S. state of Utah. Um, there are gold statues of gulls, and, like, you know, there are gulls engraved on street signs and on public monuments, and gulls are considered, you know, divine in the state of Utah. And that goes back to kind of a funny story, which is dramatized here in, uh, in this. When, um, when Mormon settlers went to the Great Salt Lake Valley and started trying to build a settlement. At one point, there was, uh, well, you'll see what happens. ...gratified with what we've accomplished during his absence. A score of babies born, more than 100 houses built, crops planted, and first grain heading up. Just in time to save us all from starvation. I knew we'd make out. Uh-oh. Don't do that. You too. At least do it in private. Uh oh. Look, there's another. Look, the, the sky's full of. Them. Oh no. Before they attack our crops. Oh no, the crops. Shield the crops with your bodies, I guess. Anything that can fight with. Uh, anyway. Um, I think it was crickets, actually, in real life. Crickets were reported, not not locusts or grasshoppers. Don't people catch them to eat? I mean, they could have done that. There's a lot of protein there. I've actually eaten grasshoppers before. Um, fried in peanut oil, they're not, they're not too bad. It's kind of like, they're kind of like very bland popcorn. Yeah. Although I've heard you can also get parasites from eating them, so maybe it's not the best idea. But anyway, you're also kind of uh, destroying the crops there, folks. Uh, you start getting their exercise. I don't. I don't think settler farmers are are. I don't think exercise is the thing that they they're lacking the most of. You know. I wish this were louder, too. This is as high as the volume can go. It's at 600% on my browser attack. Where is that god of yours now? Who brought us to this promised land? You mustn't lose faith, Jim. I never had it. How <laughs> right I was. A lot of good your preaching and praying and singing has done you. It's the only thing left for us now. Gasp! I know, right, Lenina? Yeah. Uh... Brethren! 
Let us Did they say Sistren? Is that even a word? Sistren? Let's all unite in prayer. Is crazy stopping to pray at a time like this? You should be giving the Gettysburg Address. Old fool. Almighty God. Anyway. Down upon these thy children, we beseech thee. Hear our prayer. <laughs> we have worked hard and endured much, O oh Lord. For these four score and seven years. Where we could worship thee according to our lights. Anyway, it is a it is a beautiful little story. You gotta admit that it's very fun. So tired, so worn. Pray, Jim, pray. <laughs> She's like, not right now. I have a headache, and also we're praying. Judith, you look so tired, so worn. Pray, Jim, pray. And then he has a change of heart. Rid us of these vomits, Lord. Even as thou didst rid the land of Egypt of its plague of locusts in the days of Moses. I'm pretty sure he sent the locusts. Save this land. Do you have the story goes? Not for myself, but for her, O oh Lord. Amen. We ask it in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, look at those divine creatures. Never seen such a beautiful sight. Here in the middle of the desert? Angels, <laughs> says Rab, yeah. This is what angels look like in, in Utah. Local mythology. They're eating us. They're eating us. Straight from heaven. Thank you. Oh, and look at the again. I always say, look, look at this look she gives him. Thank you. She's like, oh, oh, he's so devout now. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Gulls. We had our own miracle of the gulls today. We managed to get that in just six guesses. Oh man, I thought we'd expend all our guesses uh, with that massive polytomy at Neonathy. But, um. Anyway. Yeah. Uh. The funny thing about the, the miracle of the gulls. Is that, um. It didn't really happen like that. Uh, that's why the California gull, by the way, is the state bird of Utah. <laughs> the California gull is the state bird of Utah. But, um... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, the original, like, historical sources for this don't actually mention that. It seems to have been a later invention. There was definitely a plague of... I think it was crickets? Like, Jerusalem cricket, crickets? Um, which see major population booms in the American West, like... There have been multiple times when I've been driving out to go do field work in Utah or Wyoming or Montana, and there's just thousands or millions of crickets just all over the road. Because they have these massive population booms. Almost like cicadas. Um, and they're just everywhere. And so there's just like a gross, sticky pavement of dead crickets all over the road from all these cars running them over. Um, it, it's a normal, natural thing. And this also happened at the time then, too, but nobody actually mentioned gulls in, like, the original historical sources. I think that was kind of a later invention. But, um, anyway, I'll give you a link to this if you'd like to read about it. There you go. And Jerusalem crickets are also called Mormon crickets. Uh, Rahab Mahakala, I think because of this. Um, yeah. There we go. These insects, now called Mormon crickets because of this incident, are not true crickets, but instead belong to the katydid family. Oh, shoot. Okay. Huh. Anyway, they look like this. Yeah. 
Um, anyway, there is a monument, the Seagull Monument, at Temple Square in Salt Lake City. Gold seagulls. They're not seagulls, they're just gulls. They live near the Great Salt Lake, so they are native to that area. That's their natural habitat. But yeah, yeah. Common names have struck again, says Mary's face. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Sparky Pogwish says, yeah, I changed my mind about eating them. Um, with this, what, that, that doesn't look appetizing there? The three months of tier one to Nightbot. They've gifted 275 months in the channel. And holy cow, Lenina, I appreciate that very much. Good stuff. Thank you, thank you, Lenina. Appreciate you. Ah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't look delicious to you there, Sparky Pugwash? <laughs> no, thank you, I am full, says <laughs> Sparky Pugwash. I mean, that's not any more gross than, like, a lobster. People, people go nuts over lobsters. And they are, they're pretty horrid animals, you know? Um... You know? Like... People go nuts over eating these things. Although they didn't used to. That's that's actually like an interesting historical footnote is that back in, um, like, colonial America, back in the 16 and 1700s, there were actually laws on the books that said that you couldn't feed prisoners lobster more than once a week because it was considered, like, cruel and unusual punishment. Like, ma making people eat rats or something like that. Um, it's interesting how our, our perspectives change on which animals are good to eat and which aren't. Um, honestly, it's hard to keep track of. Sometimes it's easier just to not eat animals in general. <laughs> that's, that's the tactic that I've adopted. But yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, back to, uh, Megalosaurus here. Which is our topic for the day. Let's get back to this. We had a, a neat video here that I was going to go over. Where was that? With a volunteer. Well, here, let's take a look at this first. This case is all about Megalosaurus. It was a giant nine meter long lizard that roamed around Oxfordshire around about 160 million years ago. Well, it's not a lizard. It's a dinosaur. What? He's going to correct that, right? He said lizard. That roamed around Oxfordshire around about a giant nine meter long lizard that roamed. It's not a lizard. He's going to correct that, right? Around Oxfordshire around about 160 million years ago. But how do we know this? I mean, even I'm not that old. Well, this was first found by William Buckland, who was a geologist in the 19th century. He quickly realized what he had, but also that there were no nine meter long carnivorous lizards wandering around Oxfordshire. So he reasoned that at some time in the past they must have been here, but had gone extinct. Yep. As other bones were discovered all around the country and all around the planet, the name dinosaur was thought up to describe them. So here in this case, we have the first described bones of any dinosaur, and they show how much our wildlife and our planet has changed through its long history. Cool stuff. Yeah. There is a link right there to that video. And then there was another video, I think, that was put together from a volunteer at... Oh, wait, shoot. This is new. Six hours ago from something called IFLS Science. Well, well, well. 200 years ago, scientists named a dinosaur for the first time. 
It was yep. called Megalosaurus, and the moment almost passed us by because at that time, we didn't actually know what a dinosaur was. That name, dinosaur, didn't come around until 20 years later. Since yep. then, the field of paleontology has come on leaps and bounds. And we've and got I know never went there. I'm peculiar being peculiar prehistoric sarcastic. characters to choose from. And scientists are discovering and naming new species. Uh, no! Don't use garbage fake stock footage like this. That is so annoying. And is that thunder? Shoot. Here, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Species every year. Garbage still stock big footage. Gaps in the geological Ugh. record, which we don't know much about. Sometimes because we haven't found the fossils. Sometimes because the animals that live then don't transfer very well to the fossil record. And yes, I am talking about you, Megalodon. Why would you have bones made out of cartilage? To mark 200 years since the naming of Megalosaurus, I'm here at the Natural History Museum in London to speak to one of their lead paleontologists, Professor Paul Barrett about what we've learned about Megalosaurus, what we still don't know, and what he hopes we're going to find out about dinosaurs in the future. This is a brand new video. This just premiered six hours ago. Uh... And it was thunder, Rahab, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Professor Paul Barrett, it's so great to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you this morning. It's an exciting room to be in and a relevant one for today because we're here to talk about Megalosaurus. Yeah. The first dinosaur named by a scientist. Named on this very day, February 20th, 1824, 200 years ago on this very day. But am I right in thinking when they found it, we didn't know what dinosaurs were. So what did they think they were looking at? That's exactly right. So this was named way back in 1824. And this was yeah. a, a number of years of people finding odd bones in the ground and wondering about them. But eventually they put two and two together and realized that these weren't just any old bones, but they were the bones of a giant reptile. And that's and where- Again, they... like the garbage stock footage here. Like this is not, this is like literally just something that a stock image website put together. Which is really frustrating that, like, I don't know. This is one of the reasons I get frustrated with IFL science is that, like, a lot of their science stuff is just really low effort or, like, the people putting it together. It's just very low rent, you know? Once we knew only that they vanished. Brits! Now we know the dinosaurs ruled the land longer than any creature before them or since. Thank you, thank you for the raid, Creatrix Brit. How are you doing? Brit and their 22 raiders want to know more than that. Welcome back to Paleontologizing, Brit. How was your stream? I hope it was really good. It is wonderful to have you here. Holy cow. Um. Holy moly. Welcome, welcome. Brit and raiders. And a very... Funny, I mean, you know... Dinosaurs are kind of funny. Uh, Mortigro Satter, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. Wonderful to have you here. Today, everybody, we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the description of Megalosaurus, the first dinosaur ever scientifically described. This is the lower jaw of Megalosaurus here. Or rather, this is my 3D print of that original specimen which was published on this very day in 1824. 200 years ago today, the first dinosaur was scientifically published. Super exciting. So happy Megalosaurus Bicentennial to all of you. Yeah. Um, Britt, how was your stream today? I hope it was really good. What did you get up to? For those of you who are not familiar with Creatrix Brit, she does all kinds of creative things. Many of them related to Star Wars. She does 3D printing, cosplay creation, all kinds of cool stuff. Go give her a follow if that sounds interesting. She's also really chill and fun to hang out with on stream. So, uh, go give her a follow right now. Yeah. 
finishing up 3D printing projects and Mandalorian armor. Creatrix Brit, holy cow. Um, I might need to email you about that, actually. Um, yeah, I need to get a plug for, um, uh, what's it called? Beskar. I might need that for this next summer of fieldwork. So, uh, maybe, maybe we can talk. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> thank you, Britt. <laughs> uh, let's get back to, to this video, talking about Megalosaurus here. That's not Megalosaurus. This is some, like, garbage stock footage. This stuff costs money, too. Like, you can... You can get actual images of, like, that are decent that you don't have to pay for, but this is the whole, like, IFL science thing. They it frustrates me sometimes. This is what I was talking about when you got here, Britt. But, um... Finding odd bones in the ground yeah. and wondering about them. Hugan says, I'd rather have stock footage than AI Im imagery, to be honest. The video's not over. We'll see if they do that, too, Hugan. Oy. Um... And Zach M. Rutledge, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizer. Before we continue with this, I should say that um, 200 years ago, or maybe a little bit less than that, the reconstructions took a while to make, but this is what they thought Megalosaurus looked like at the time, because they only had a handful of bones, and dinosaurs were brand new. Nobody knew what they looked like. Nobody had any idea what sort of creatures these were. And so they're working on very limited information. And Megalosaurus was thought to have looked like this, based on a few bones from the jaws, some teeth, some pillar-like limb bones. They at least know that the animal held its limbs directly under its body, which was a huge deal at the time. They realized it was a reptile, but they didn't give it sprawling limbs here. Anyway, so this is like a very early attempt at reconstructing a dinosaur based on very, very limited material. Nowadays, we've got more or less complete skeletons of megalosauroids, and so we know that the megalosaurus itself probably looked a lot like this. Much different from that depiction there. This is a beautiful modern portrait of megalosaurus, which I put on the... This is actually a plastic model that you can buy. Exquisite work from the company PNSO. I put this on my wish list at the beginning of, toward the beginning of today's stream, and it has mysteriously disappeared. So it seems like a very, very generous benefactor may have purchased it. Um, so Salamander says, ha, 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 Salamander, you didn't have something to do with this, did you? Uh, maybe, said <laughs> Salamander. Well, well, well. Well, well, well. I eagerly await its arrival. I incredible community, Lenina. Salamander, thank you for, for being part of it. Thank you for your, your generosity. You've been caught. You know, you left some pretty obvious clues there, Salamander. I think you wanted to be caught. <laughs> Appreciate you. Yeah. Um, and Zach M. Rutledge. Lego T-Rex skull is on the docket. Oh, that sounds cool, Zach. What does that look like? Um, pretty snazzy partner badge you got there, by the way, Zach. What kind of stuff do you stream? Um... That's not too shabby. Not too shabby. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool, cool. I like they, they actually got... Oh, that keyhole-shaped orbit. They really got that. Good for them. Very nice. One of those rowdy Lego boys. <laughs> Sounds like a Dukes of Hazard reference or something. Those, le those rowdy Lego boys. Calls him a ruckus. <laughs> cool, Zach. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Anyway, I appreciate you being here. Um, let's get back to this little video on 
Megalosaurus here. Here we go. Lego my Stego, says Steely Dan, yeah. Uh, there's the original jaw there? No, a different one. Different jaw. And you sleep Professor well, Claire. Thanks Claire, for being here. It's so great to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you this morning. It's an exciting room to be in and a relevant one for today because we're here to talk about Megalosaurus, the first Thank you, dinosaur for the named hydrate. by a scientist. Cheers. Yeah, am I right in thinking when they found it, we didn't know what dinosaurs were? So what did they think they were looking at? That's exactly right. So this was named way back in 1824. And this was a number of years of people finding odd bones in the ground and wondering about them. But eventually they put two and two together and realized that these weren't just any old bones, but they were the bones of a giant reptile. And that's where the name Megalosaurus comes from. Do it. Oh no. Lizard. <laughs> and so what they thought it was, was just a souped up regular type of lizard. They thought it was essentially a huge iguana or a huge Komodo dragon type animal. And who was making yeah, they're wrong about that. Discoveries? So it's actually named by a guy called William Buckland. And William Buckland was a cleric who was also a fellow at the University of Oxford. He was yep. a very eminent geologist. He was one of the first geologists really going out into the UK and actually traveling abroad as well and looking at the rocks and trying to categorize them. And by doing that, he also started looking at the fossils inside them. And he also found a few other bones that were lying around in collections in Oxford that had been found by earlier workers and put them all together because he realized they were all part of the same creature. But that word dinosaur, I think it was about 20 years before it came around. So how did we get from Megalosaurus to there? So Megalosaurus appears in 1824 to much acclaim, like people have never really seen anything like this. And then more yeah. and more bones of these things start to come out from Oxfordshire and from Sussex and from Kent. And they start to be found in other parts of the UK. So museums start to build up collections of these. And then a couple of years later, after all of these remains have built up and various people have studied them, suddenly Richard Owen, who was the leading anatomist at the time, realized that these three animals had something in common. They weren't just big lizards or big crocodiles, they were something distinct. And that's what led him to come up with the name dinosaur in 1842. And it was his lobbying that actually got the Natural History Museum built in the first place. And Megalosaurus, it was the first dinosaur named, but to our knowledge today, it wasn't the first. So which do we, at our present knowledge, think was the oldest dinosaur? Megalosaurus yeah. is about 164 million years old from the middle part. So it's, Megalosaurus is like from, it's from the older half of the age of dinosaurs, from the middle Jurassic. Let me show you what that means here. To our international chronostratigraphic chart right here. So, we're up here at the very top, within those black pixels right there, um, at the uh, the end of the Cenozoic, part of the Quaternary period, uh, the Holocene, which is this tiny little sliver above the Pleistocene. Now, in order to get to dinosaurs, except for birds, all the dinosaurs that aren't birds, some that are too, the non-avian dinosaurs, you gotta go back to the Cretaceous period. Dinosaurs also existed in the Jurassic and Triassic periods. Dinosaurs first evolved probably here, maybe like at the end of the Middle Triassic. And sometimes Lower, Middle, and Upper are not... Those don't always correspond to time. Like the Upper Triassic is the majority of the Triassic period. But anyway, dinosaurs first evolve about here. Megalosaurus is from the Middle Jurassic period up here. It's about 165 million years ago, something like that. Middle Jurassic for Megalosaurus. Um, dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops are from the Maastrichtian stage of the Upper Cretaceous period. Dinosaurs like T-Rex are closer in time to us, to you and me and Twitch.tv, than they are to Megalosaurus. T-Rex and Triceratops are closer to today in time than they are to Megalosaurus, which is pretty cool to think about. The age of dinosaurs is really long. Dinosaurs were around for about 160 million years, give or take a few. Long, long time. 
Whereas the age of mammals has only been 66 million years long so far. And we as human beings have only existed for like, maybe... Depending on how you count it, depending on what you count as a, a human versus a human ancestor, we've been around for maybe half a million years. Something like that. Maybe, maybe fewer. You know? Yeah. And Tyrannosaurus was here when the asteroid came down. Exactly. 66 million years ago. Where it, uh... It arrived like, uh, like a black cat onto the stream. You know? Um... Just... Wreaking havoc. <laughs> uh, how are you doing, Moon Pie? Your counterpart, Mini Pie, was causing all kinds of problems earlier. But you're not going to do that, are you? You're much more mild mannered, Moon Pie. Well, but you're also much more moody. So, you know, it's a give and take. Um. Moon. Whoop, hang on. Camera's frozen. There we go. Moon Pie, how are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Shake it, Moon Pie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Oh, and nice, Manina. So happy. Ios and Lordy are coming home in a few hours. They're flying home right now. And you're gonna be so excited to see them. You know, I'm done with this schmuck. This Danny guy. I wanna see see the girls. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Is that a good keyboard? Wanna do some typing? Do some typing? What do you think? Yeah. Oh, Moon Pie. Moon Pie. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all we have is if we can get Sweetie Pie to make an appearance, then that'll be that'll be a hat trick. It'll be all three cats. All three cats. What do you think? Can we make that happen? I see Sweetie Pie over there. Hello, Sweetie Pie. Maybe we can entice Sweetie Pie with a treat in a little bit. Yeah. Um. And I'll see you soon, Hybrid Robotics. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Oh, look at you. Look at you. Scratch up my desk pad with those claws, though. You hear? You hear? Watch out with those claws. You are scratching it up. Oh, goodness. This is why we can't have nice things, cats. You know? Because cats are agents of destruction. I've been quoted as saying, and it's true, that if, if house cats, you know, Felis catus, if they were only like twice as big, they would frequently bring home the cadavers of neighborhood children and, <laughs> and <laughs> deposit them on your doorstep. Um, they are they are beasts. They are wild, fearsome beasts that we have in our houses. And you you slobbered all over my all over the place here, Moon Pie. You're so, you're so drooly and snotty. Yeah, that's why there should be indoors. Absolutely, Mosolith. And all three of the cats who live here in this house live here in this house. They do not get let outside. Because there are cars and coyotes and birds of prey who would wish to eat these cats. Maybe neighbors, too. I used to live in... When I lived in Bozeman, Montana, there was a neighbor who would who bragged about, um, about shooting and eating the, the neighbor's cats when they would go into his yard. Big, like, libertarian guy. It was all about property rights. It was like, 
the cats come in my yard, they're my property. I need to eat them. Um, gross guy. Uh, and Vintage SoGal, hello, hello to you. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Well, my goodness. Who is it? Vintage Sogal is calling in with 26 readers to talk about dinosaurs. Um, holy cow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here, Vintage Sogal. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And hello, Moonpie. Moonpie, would you like to help welcome the raiders? Hey, look over there at the camera. Here. Whoa. Sorry, cat cam. Cat cam. Yeah. Oh, I love you, Mumbai. Uh, Vintage Sogal, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. So you came in at a kind of an odd moment. But the paleontologist field is narrow to what we understand. On the contrary, we stretch our understanding to try and take in the universe. Jack Blues, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. It is wonderful to have you here. Thanks for following. And uh, Vintage Sogal, how was your stream? I hope it was fantastic. Welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza, and this is Moon Pie here. One of three cats who, who live here in this house. These are my feline overlords. They lived here before I moved in. So they have the run of the place. But uh, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and today we are celebrating an exciting anniversary, aren't we, Moon Pie? It is the 200th anniversary of the scientific description of the very first dinosaur ever published. Megalosaurus Bucklandi was published on this very day, February 20th, 1824. And so it has been 200 years now that we have had dinosaurs in the scientific literature. Of course, the word dinosaur didn't even exist back in 1824, but, um... Pie. I'm glad this is a 3D print. If this were the real thing, I'd be afraid that you would damage it or it would damage you. Those teeth are, are sharp. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Um, here, let me get to my stream deck. Pardon me. Oh, I know you want cuddles. I know you want cuddles. And you're, I'm gonna have to vacuum again. You're sending hair everywhere. It was vacuumed last night. Uh, Vintage SMB, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Holy cow, and Boosted Brims, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um. Anyway, everybody, it's wonderful to have you here. We were just watching a little video on Megalosaurus. It just came out today, but it does seem we've got some cool new folks here. Would anybody like to see a quick little welcome video? It's a dinosaur. And Cat Yoy, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. If you'd like a, a quick welcome video to kind of introduce you to the channel, type a one into the chat, especially if you're new. And I'd be happy to play a little welcome video for you with previously recorded Danny. Um, we have one more video today that we haven't played yet. So I, it won't be a repeat from today. Um, all right, well, excellent. Without further ado, Moon Pie, let's call forth previously recorded Danny. In fact, look, look. There he is back there. You see him? He's sneaking up behind us. Um, Raiders and uh, Vintage Sogal and everybody else. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a good friend of ours. We call him previously recorded Danny. And uh, he'll tell you a little bit about who I am, what this channel is all about, why in the world a paleontologist is here on Twitch, all that good stuff. So without further ado, previously recorded, Danny, go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks, present day Danny. Well, if you're new here, then uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. You might be wondering to yourself, uh, where's the video game? Well, my name's Danny Anduza, and I'm a paleontologist. I don't really do too much in the way of video games, I guess. I work on dinosaurs. But 
how does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, I'll tell you. It all started when I moved to Montana right out of high school. In my first week there, I started working in the Paleo Lab at Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was probably the greatest dinosaur museum on the planet. If you've ever seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you're more familiar with that institution and with my old boss than you may realize. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said that the guy, Alan Grant, was you. Yes, yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that program that Jack Horner built that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. I learned a lot of that from Jack Horner's last graduate student, this guy, Denver Fowler, who would go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. Under Denver, I did nearly a decade's worth of fieldwork digging at hundreds of sites in the Upper Cretaceous, excavating literally hundreds of dinosaurs. Here's just a few highlights. In 2012, I discovered the world's oldest specimen of Chasmosaurus, hopefully soon to be published as a new species. In 2017, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. I've also been lucky enough to help collect another very important specimen, the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. And much like my fieldwork, my research is also centered on dinosaurs. Some of that deals with new genera and species, like this guy, Truarcuncus, a bizarre little theropod from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, who was just published in July of 2020. I've got a few studies in the works right now, some of them focusing on dinosaur biogeography, and some others on behavioral functional morphology, basically looking at bizarre features of dinosaur skeletal anatomy and trying to figure out why those features evolved. And one of my current projects involves spinosaurs, but I can't really talk about that until it's closer to publication, so uh, don't ask me about it yet. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things were definitely on the decline in Montana, so I packed up and moved back to the West Coast, and I have been so much happier here. I've also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-deadening bureaucracy within academia. So for the time being, anyway, I've moved my career in a different direction. And lucky for me, it happens to pay a lot better, too. I kind of stumbled my way into a job in early childhood education. I get to make a real difference in kids' lives and help instill a love of nature and a burning curiosity for the world around them. Then coronavirus descended and the school shut its doors. But I wasn't about to let a global pandemic stop me and my students. We just moved online. One, two, three. I love digging in the dirt. With just a pick and brush, finding fossils is my aim, and so I'm never in a rush because the treasures that I see are rare and ancient things, like Velociraptor's jumps or Archaeopteryx's wings, and all the kids want to see them lining up at a home museum. I am Hope Alientologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. I am a paleontologist. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. That's who I am, that's who I am, that's who I am. Having made the jump to teaching remotely, it was only a short leap from there to Twitch. I started streaming in May of 2020, and it's been tremendously rewarding. Now, it's my belief that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about your science is one of the most important things a researcher can do. Twitch is kind of an ideal medium for that. This is my passion, and now I get to share it with you. And what could be cooler than that? It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. 
And if you can help out by continuing to watch, or if you can afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So, for my regular viewers, thank you for sitting through that again. And uh, for everybody who's new, welcome. We've got a fantastic little community going here, and uh, we'd be really happy if you'd join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Vintage SoGal for that raid there. I really appreciate it. Again, today we are talking about Megalosaurus on the 200th anniversary of its initial publication. Its description by William Buckland. Megalosaurus here. Um, very, very important creature. Let's get back to this video, shall we? And uh, hello, hello, Ken. How are you doing? Good to have you here. Ken, I hope you're having a good day. Team stopped building up collections of these. Uh, and then a couple of years later, after all of these remains have built up and various people have studied them, suddenly Richard Owen, who was the... Oh, and by the way, shoot, I should mention for all the new folks as well, uh, like Lenina was just posting there. Yeah, yeah, that, that video that we just watched, the, the welcome video, is a little on the old side. I think that back in 2020. A lot has changed since then. I actually now do Twitch full time. This is a dream come true for me to be able to do science outreach five days a week and make my living doing this. This is how I fund my research and my field work and everything else. And speaking of field work, we were digging up dinosaurs in Wyoming and Utah this past summer, summer of 2023, live on stream. Check out the YouTube page if you want to see the uh the recordings of those live streams um digging up at least three new species of dinosaur in uh in western wyoming and eastern utah and ken was here for uh for both of those outings so uh hopefully we'll be again this summer ken do you think you'll be out with us again this summer um i hope so ken is ken is good company um and he knows what he's doing out there um yeah yeah uh as much as i can says ken awesome awesome i'm looking forward to it i was just talking with ethan today um yeah yeah uh, we still got to find some funding for wyoming it looks like but we might have an ace in the hole there we'll we'll have to see it depends on well we'll see anyway Let's get back to this. The anatomist of the time realized that these yeah. three animals had something in common. They weren't just big lizards or big. And I'm working on that, sir. I'm working on that. And that's what led him to come up with the name dinosaur in 1842. And it was his lobbying that actually got the Natural History Museum built in the first place. Really? Oh, Owen did that. Yeah. Yeah. And. Megalosaurus, it was the first dinosaur named, but to our knowledge today, it wasn't the first. So, which do wasn't we, the earliest dinosaur, at our no. present knowledge, think was the oldest dinosaur? Megalosaurus like is Eeyore about after. 164 million years old from the middle part of the Jurassic period. The first yeah. dinosaurs that we know about for sure lived on Earth about 230 million years ago in what's called the Late Triassic period. And there are some hints that dinosaurs might have appeared even earlier. We actually have another fossil in this room that might be of an animal that's a bit older still, about 240 million years old. Is that Nyasasaurus? Is that what he's talking about? Is Nyasasaurus in the... is it in London? It's from Tanzania. But yeah, described in 56 by Alan Cherig. Cherig was a... he worked at the, the museum in London. Um... That's been 50B. There we go. Um, yeah, type from NHM UK Natural History Museum, United Kingdom. R6856 is the specimen number. So yeah, that must have been what Paul Barrett was referring to there. Yeah. Lived on Earth about 230 million years ago in what's called the Late Triassic period. And there are some hints that dinosaurs might have appeared even earlier. We actually have another fossil in this room that might be of an animal that's a bit older still, about 240 million years old. 
We don't know if Neosasaurus is a dinosaur or not, though. That is the thing. Is it a dinosaur? Is it a Silosaur? Is it some sort of very dinosaur-like dinosaur form? The fossils are so fragmentary that it's really hard to tell. Yeah. That is the contender for possibly the first dinosaurs to ever walk the Earth. Megalosaurus, it, we talked earlier about how it's seen as this uh, massive reptile and it gets given this name, but I'm always quite a big fan of the story of how I believe it was almost called Scrotum Humanum. For a few hundred years. It was, actually. Or at least, like, bits of the thigh bone were, uh, were called. And let's remember, keep this PG-rated, chat. Um, we've got you know, kids who show up here. The story yeah. of how I believe it was almost called scrotum humanum. For a f yeah. A few hundred years before the material of Megalosaurus was, it was kind of a joke, though. A few odd bones were still turning up under the plow in places like Oxfordshire. And one of those bones is the end of a thigh bone. And this thigh bone has a very suggestive shape. It's just the end of a thigh bone. Initially, they thought it was part of an elephant, and maybe the Romans had brought it over. Then they thought maybe it was part of a giant man. And that's when I don't think anybody actually thought that. Like the kind of salacious turn, where they decided that this bit, if it was a giant man, was a, a very well endowed giant man, let's say. And so eventually this bit of bone became named Scrotum Humanum. But it turns out that that thigh bone is probably a bit of a Megasaurus thigh bone. Yeah, and here I'll, I'll show you. Yeah, Robert Plot's lost dinosaur bone. This is an illustration of that bone there. You can see why somebody jokingly called it that. They didn't do like a perfect illustration of it because it actually looks like this. But yeah, anyway, um, here's a link to that in case you're curious. And thank you, Linnea. Yeah, let's keep it peachy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So standing in front of a bunch of original bones of Megalosaurus, these ones were found these way back knees, in the 19th century. Harry, yes, the thank you, the original Harry. bones were found just outside Oxford. And the bone I'm touching just uh, here is him. actually a shin bone of Megalosaurus. <laughs> and you can see it's about 70, 80 centimeters long, just to give you an idea of how big that animal is. And just below that, we have one of the hip bones of this animal as well. You can see pretty enormous. What we find is that this animal turns out to be about nine meters in length, a very decently lengthened skull with lots of sharp pointed teeth. Those teeth are curved with lots of steak knife like serrations running down the edges, suggesting that it was a meat eater. And this would have been an animal that was essentially at the time living on a bunch of tropical islands set in a shallow warm sea. A little bit like, it's hard to imagine, but Oxford was a little bit like the Bahamas back in the middle Jurassic. And this would have been the top predator on those islands, probably occasionally even swimming between them, feeding on the other animals that were living there. Also, the word dinosaur. So that that kind of reminds me of like um, the depiction of Eustreptospondylus from Walking with Dinosaurs. Um, Eustreptospondylus, Walking with Dinosaurs. There we go. Yeah. Um, kind of like this. Eustreptospondylus may or may not be a megalosaurid like Megalosaurus. And Dame Karen, I don't think anybody actually legitimately believed that. I think it was mostly a joke. But yeah. So yeah, Megalosaurus would have looked a lot like this, honestly. Anyway. Yeah. Where even that as a name almost fell out of use. 
How did we go from thinking that it might be an obsolete group to realizing that it was a very established group of animals? Well, megalosaurs, yeah. Some people yeah. thought the dinosaurs formed a single group. Some people oh. thought they had lots of different ancestors that we hadn't yet found, and there was a lot of confusion. But since about the 1980s, we... I mean, this garbage stock footage here, like... It's just the lowest effort. Uh, We've now had a consensus among scientists that they were a natural group, a single group with a common ancestor. And that common ancestor diversified into lots and lots of different sorts of dinosaurs. It's... Uh, what in the world is this supposed to be? The interview is great! The, the stock footage is just dog water. This is... Oh boy. Yeah, and Ken says, I do love how in Walking with Dinosaurs they just used an allosaur or anything. They didn't have a good idea what it looked like. Yeah, like the polar allosaur from the Australia episode. Yeah, yeah, the salamander knows, yeah. Yeah. That's what we see today. And those features yeah. are mainly to do with features of their hips, features of their legs. Oh, th that's in Moab, Utah. Again, just today. stock footage here. those features are mainly to do with features of... Yeah, this is Moab Giants. Um... I almost went here a couple years ago, and then it turned out to be closed at the time. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway. Their hips, features of their legs, and a few other more Easter features. Man, garbage stock footage. This stuff's fake. It's fake. Fake. This is like kids in a sandbox. Fake. Uh, I missed the bold too, Ken. Yeah. It's coming up, though. It's coming up. So over the years, I think there's been a few species just of Megalosaurus, but now we think there's only one. What's the situation? So there's yeah, a... it was a wastebasket taxon for the longest time. This is, uh, oh, this is like a, a classic idea in, in dinosaur paleontology. Back when Megalosaurus was first found, we didn't really have a good idea for like how diverse dinosaurs were. And so if a new meat-eating dinosaur was found, rather than giving it a new genus name or something, they often just called it Megalosaurus you know, Grandensis, Megalosaurus, Terribilis, Megalosaurus, etc. Like, everything was Megalosaurus. They kept, like, throwing all these different dinosaurs into the genus Megalosaurus where they didn't belong, but nobody knew any better back then, you know? ...species at the moment, which is called Megalosaurus Bucklandi, and that species name yeah. from Rex William Buckland, who described Megalosaurus in the first place. But over the years, a number of other big meeting dinosaurs were also thought to be called Megalosaurus, and this goes back to old ideas about how we would classify animals, and what we call a waste basket taxon. Megalosaurus basically became a name that people would throw yep. any big, large, meat-eating dinosaur into without really thinking about that whether it was related Ugh. to Megalosaurus or not. And over the years, there's been a very careful program to actually go through all of these species of Megalosaurus and work out, are they really Megalosaurus or are they actually something different? And, and what they're almost always only went through yeah. was that the only real species of Megalosaurus is Megalosaurus bucklandi. So what do we know about Buckland eye when it was living. All of our finds are mainly of isolated bones, and that's because of the way that they were collected. But when we take all yeah. of those bones together, we can actually piece together quite a lot of the animal. And when we do do that, what we find is that Megalosaurus okay, yeah. is an animal that's <laughs> up to about nine meters long, so pretty hefty, large predator with wartime hind legs only, like all the other meat eating dinosaurs. And it came uh, equipped, as you might guess, with like a large number of big, sharp, pointed teeth that it would have used for ripping through prey. Across your career, what would you say have been some of the biggest steps we've made in our understanding of dinosaurs? The first complete skeletons of dinosaurs that were found, which came along in the late 19th century, started to bring all those bits and pieces together and helped to show how many different types of I don't know who made these, like, stock videos of, of dinosaur excavations, but I am, I am, I am cross with them. It's really frustrating because A, it looks fake, and B, we don't need more misinformation on the internet, you know? There's lots and lots of footage of actual paleontologists digging up actual dinosaur fossils. And with the amount of money that went into creating this stock footage in the first place, which can't have been particularly cheap, you could probably have actually funded a real-life dinosaur dig with the amount of money that it took to put on this fake one here. 
You know, it's just, uh, it's so frustrating. The dinosaurs we've had, and also what dinosaurs look like. Then the next big leaps actually happen a bit later in the 20th century, when we start finding dinosaurs that have a number of features that are suspiciously like those in birds. And so the discovery of some small, fast-running, meaty... And no, I'm sure they paid for that, Dave and Karen. That stock footage is not going to be freely available, I don't think. No. Um... And Cirque says the footage definitely lessens the impact of the interview, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a lot of the stuff that IFL science does is kind of like that. It's like, I don't know. I find it irritating as a scientist. King dinosaurs in the 1960s with yeah. very bird-like features, very bird-like hands and hips and arms. And is that footage freely available, though? Mine is on YouTube. All, all of the live stream footage that I have of digging up dinosaurs this summer is freely available, yeah. And the thing is, like, if you talk to scientific organizations, they'd probably be happy to supply you with, with real footage if they have it. Um, it's like, this is just sheer laziness, you know? Started to suggest maybe birds and dinosaurs are linked. And then I'd say the Including final like all these forwards, if garbage like, stock images. We found dinosaurs on with feathers, which cemented that bird length and also brought in a lot of other things to do with behavior and the biology of dinosaurs that we now think about in a much more bird-like way. This is not even a dinosaur, nor is it a bird. That's a pterosaur. Like, they're just... Whoever was editing this video together for IFL Science did not know what they were doing. They lacked the basic paleontological knowledge to actually do this correctly. And it's it's a real shame, because this is a good interview. Like, actually interviewing Paul Barrett about Megalosaurus, you know, for the 200th anniversary of its description. Like, this is cool stuff. And it's just lessened tremendously by the inclusion of garbage stock images and stock footage. Like in a reptile -like way. Is there anything about dinosaurs that you're kind of surprised we haven't yet discovered? Or and these are good questions. Yeah. Right when I used to give talks about dinosaurs 20 years ago when I was a PhD student, I used to say things stupidly like, we will never know the color of a dinosaur. But we now know the colors of some dinosaurs yeah. because of new yeah. chemical techniques and new types of fossils like these guys. that have been found. So I, nowadays, I never say we will never know this about dinosaurs because I've been proved wrong several times. <laughs> that's a but great. There are still lots oh, man. of gaps in our knowledge about them. We I gotta know clip that and use that. That's wonderful. About how dinosaurs first start to take over. So we know a few early dinosaurs, but we don't really know why they survived a bunch of extinctions and went on to become the greatest animals on Earth. Uh, we also have lots of gaps in our knowledge about even very familiar dinosaurs. So things like T-Rex, which is a favorite for many people. Uh, we know lots about T-Rex thanks to having about 35 really good skeletons of it. And more are found every year. But we've never found a T-Rex egg or a T-Rex baby. And we have very little information yep. on things like T-Rex skin. But we're still waiting for new discoveries to come along to complete our picture of what they really look like. And that... Not to dig too much... Uh, well, not to not to rag too much on English dinosaur paleontology, but that's what do you say? We have to wait for more discoveries to come along, <laughs> maybe so we could purchase them <laughs> at the NHM in London. It's just uh, I don't know. It's just. Many of us here in the States have just got a very different attitude about this kind of thing. Like, I wouldn't say wait for more discoveries to come along. I would say we make those discoveries. We go out and we do field work. You know, it's just a very different kind of attitude. T-Rex egg or a T-Rex baby. And we have very little information on things like T-Rex skin. But we're still waiting for new discoveries to come along to complete our picture of what they really look like. Yeah, you don't wait for those discoveries. You go out and you make them. To be fair, Paul Barrett probably doesn't do field work. So I guess he would be waiting for those discoveries to be made. But I don't, it's just kind of anathema to like, it's not how I operate, you know? Like, ah, uh, ah! Uh. Yeah. Ambush paleontologist, there you go, Linian. Yeah. <laughs> A sit and wait paleontologist. <laughs> Which. What's That's been true the, for a lot of people. key focus of your work? So it's Again, not, not trying to rag on anybody in particular here. It's just like... I, I feel like in... Still, field work is underappreciated even in paleontology because sometimes people at really high-profile institutions who get a lot of media attention and stuff like that, they like often downplay the importance of field work in ways that sometimes they're not even aware of. And... 
spent yeah. a lot of time looking at skulls. And they no longer have an entire empire to dig in. I mean, it, it stuns... True, Ken, but the sun still never sets on the British Empire even today. You know? The British Commonwealth... I mean, what do they still have? The Falkland Islands? The... B Jamaica, I think? Is still under the crown? Um, Ascension Island, South Georgia. Um, there's various places in Asia and the South Pacific, I think. Yeah. Amelia Bedelia is willing to admit that here in Canada we are Commonwealth. Yes. These Canadians must still bow to the Queen. Um, they're compelled to. Um, which reminds me of a thing. I'm not, I'm not, I'm gonna preface this by saying that it's a joke, first of all, so nobody gets the wrong idea, because I don't want anybody to, anyway, but, um, you know, it'd be funny to have one of those, like, oh, whoa, whoa, anti-woke people say, say something like, uh, like, oh, you know, England, they used to be good, but now... You know, they're, they're not the same as they used to be. I heard their new queen is a man. Um. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I'm still saying exactly. Augers indeed. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, but Ken, we are very, very lucky that here in the American West and up in, in Canada... As well, like, we can literally just drive in a in an automobile. We can go to really important fossil sites and make new discoveries. Like, we don't even have to go that far from where we live to do that. And that's not necessarily true in the UK. They do have wonderful places like the Isle of Wight, which... Man, the British Museum... They're, excuse me, the Natural History Museum, as it's now called, in London... They should really have, like, full-time crews out there all the time on the Isle of Wight. They should be developing relationships with, with local people there and actually have, like, an active field program. But... Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Mikey Lex says, Stop making fun of my neighbors, Dan. I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyway, let's let's continue. Looking at how dinosaurs chewed up plant food, uh, but as time's gone on, we've got more interest in looking at dinosaur relationship, how different types are related to each other. But actually, one of the main uh, and again, lousy stock footage. This is not a dinosaur; it's an ichthyosaur and a really old-fashioned ichthyosaur at that. Where's the dorsal fin? Pterosaur here. This is not a dinosaur. Like this is just lousy stock footage that they're choosing left and right. It's very distracting. <laughs> My uh, fifty thousand a year has been well spent. Hi, and Miggity Marty, I'm trying to spend it well. Thank you, thank you for those 11 months of support now at tier three there, Miggity Marty. Thank you very, very much for that really substantive support. That means a lot. It really does. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. And that's definitely an ichthyosaur there, Rahab. It's definitely an ichthyosaur. It's just a really old-fashioned one right here. Yeah. Um, Pliosaurs have got a longer neck than that. Um, slightly longer, but noticeably longer. Yeah. Ichthyosaurs. The focuses of my work now is looking at the root of the dinosaur tree. Where did dinosaurs yeah. come from? And how did they... And Werewolf Cast says, question, do you think jewelry made of dinosaur bones, rings, etc. are ethical or not? Or jewelry made from fossils? It's kind of a gray area. Werewolf cast. It it depends. It depends on the provenance. It depends on how it was sourced. There was a thing recently, actually, um, where let's see, there we go. Over one million dollars worth of dinosaur bones allegedly stolen from Utah. Four people charged. Uh, a lot of this stuff went into stuff like jewelry, so I would recommend against buying jewelry made from dinosaur fossils, because A, it's usually fake in the first place, it's like it's usually not actually made from real fossil bone, but if it is, that's often a much bigger problem. So yeah, here. 
um, this summer when I was in the field with the Utah Geological Survey, we got a visit from the uh, the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, some like BLM officers who came over to to talk to us, and they told us a little bit about this operation that they were doing. They asked us if we had seen any suspicious people in the area trying to dig fossils, that kind of thing. Um, Cause yeah, as with any kind of like, you know, like money making a legal operation like this, whether it's selling fossils or selling heroin or something like, there's a lot of unsavory stuff going on and there's a surprising amount of overlap between people who steal dinosaur fossils from public land and people who sell weapons or or illicit drugs and stuff like that, you know? So yeah, yeah. Harry says, what about ammonites and stuff? Those are generally more okay, but it can still depend, you know? Yeah, and Dame Karen says, have you ever encountered suspicious people on a dig? Oh yeah. Um, I've literally been shot at on a dig before. Um, although that guy probably was just a very nearsighted hunter. Still, you know, it... You get stuff like that that happens, you know? When you're out there in the middle of nowhere, um... Yeah, in fact, actually... Here. Um... Let's see here... This should be in this Streaming right now via satellite. There's the Starlink dish right there. And uh, yeah, I wanted to do something unique to kind of not just tell, but show people how dinosaur paleontology works. How do we find dinosaurs? How do we dig them up? How do we get them out of the ground and back to the laboratory? That's what this is all about. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There we go. Actually, Ethan, do you want to tell that story about when uh, when those people in the side by side came through? Sure. <laughs> so our quarry kind of goes right. There's, there's a road that goes almost directly through the quarry here. Mm -hmm. So one day, me and Danny and a few other people, we were hanging out in camp, and we saw this side by side go. This sort of sort of like a big golf cart, if you don't. Like an ATV, up, yeah, with a roof yeah. on it, yeah. Yeah, with a roll cage. They came running through this old couple, and they smiled at us and waved and drove by. No, I don't, they didn't smile and wave. They just I, went I think, by. I think I saw them wave. Maybe, oh, really? No, yeah, maybe not. I, think I don't right. think they did. I think you're right, yeah. yeah. I remember you, you were just watching them intently. I just, I'd started sprinting because I realized, oh, wait, they're going to drive. Ethan just took off them. after them. Jackets and bones and nails everywhere. So without it saying anything, Ethan just bolts off after them. I'm like, shoot, and I just take off after Ethan. Like, <laughs> got to back him up. I don't know what's going on. And so we, and, we get here, and I'm uh, hoping to divert them away from the quarry or at least say, hey, don't ride here. Uh-huh. And then they turn around, and they drive by us, and then they wave and say, all right, it's, you know, they don't say anything, but they wave and then drive by. I don't even remember them waving. They, I remember they, them just they like... They at least went like this. Oh, okay, okay. We, we, we saw each other. Okay. And then the BLM came out a few <laughs> days later, and they were like, how's it going, y'all? We're just checking on you. Yeah, we, we got a call that it was like a meth lab or something out here. So <laughs> we knew it was probably you guys, because you guys are into meth, but... <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. That was, we were able to... Uh, they knew pretty much exactly who it was just by the location. Yeah. Yeah. Um... BLM's a big help. So it was, it was pretty funny, yeah. But uh, that, that guy was cool. He was cool. We uh, showed him the quarry, together. and yeah, I had a little plastic iguanodon that I bought at the Moab rock shop, so I'm like, oh, at least look at this, the dinosaur we're digging up. <laughs> um, but yeah, anyway, um, for the rest of this video, here's a link right there. And from that, you can find the other videos from uh, summer of 2023 digging up those dinosaurs there near Moab, Utah. But anyway, let's finish out this video here. Start to take over. Megalosaurus hasn't necessarily been a key focus within that. And as we've already covered, it wasn't actually the, one of the oldest dinosaurs 
does it hold a special place in your heart as one of the first named? Oh, oh yeah. It's going to hold a special place for every time the saw pain and soldiers. It's literally the first time the saw to receive a scientific name. So yep. it's, if you like, it's the core of what everyone else does. It's like the founding point of where everything else we do comes from. What are the questions about dinosaurs that you're hoping to answer next? So what I'm really hoping to find out is how the biggest groups, bigger groups of dinosaurs are really related to each other because there's still some debate about how the big groups are started their evolutionary journeys and also to work out those transformations that take place in building each of the new dinosaur groups from this very basic stock that dinosaurs start from. So my all of my focus now is mainly on getting into those very deep parts of the dinosaur tree. Well it's been mm. amazing to chat to you on 200 years of Megalosaurus Day. Thank you so yeah. much for your time Paul. It's been great to meet you. No it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for coming in. Good stuff. Good stuff. Lovely interview there. It would have been better without some of that lousy stock. Well, there finish. you have it. 200 years since the first dinosaur was ever named. On this and very we, day, 200 years ago. I would like to wish you a very merry 200 years of Megalosaurus. Awesome. And what a wonderful note to end on for today. As I give you that link. Right there. Um, a very, very happy... Megalosaurus Bicentennial to all of you. I hope you enjoyed this today. I hope you learned something. I learned a few things. And, um... You'll join me tomorrow for some additional fossil news and discussion and stuff. It's gonna be good. But for now, let's wrap this up here. And let's put uh, an Archaeopteryx under our credits there. Here we go. And who else is on Twitch doing some science currently? Um, Sage is back. Holy cow. Well, well, well. Turn for the fine grain stuff. With the we are totally going to go say hello to Rocket Sage. It's been so long. Um... She's a geologist here on Twitch. Oh, you're in for a treat, everybody. You are in for a treat. I'm so excited to say hi to Sage again. It's been like a year. Fantastic. Um, Everybody, thank you so much to everyone who's currently being named in our credits. Subscribers and resubscribers, followers and cheerers, gifters and raiders. And moderators. Mods were working hard today, and I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, mods. Um, a very happy Megalosaurus Bicentennial to all of you. We'll be back again tomorrow with some additional fossil news and a crossover stream with Belint of Science Streams. We're going to be talking about new papers in uh, the field of paleontology and the field of genetics. So I hope you'll tune in for that. It's always a good time. I look forward to it all week. With that having been said, thank you, thank you everybody. And let's go check out what Sage is up to, talking about ooh, how volcanoes work, forming new lithosphere, good stuff. I'll see you there, everybody. Let's jump in. Take care.